I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Daniel Vitalis, welcome back to the show for your, I don't know, fourth or fifth visit here. It's great to see you again, dude. Thanks for having me, Luke. Man, it's been awesome. Just your journey is just so cool, bro. I'm, I'm really impressed with where you've taken this show. Thank you. It's been uh, it's been a wild ride, man. You know, the evolution. Mm-hmm. I remember when I, God, it must have been almost five years ago when I uh, spoke alongside you at one of Neil Strauss's, uh, you know, intensives for his mastermind group. And um, you know, you and and David Wolf and Jack Cruz and Ben Greenfield and all these people that I followed and looked up to were the speakers. And I kind of weaseled my way into being a speaker at that event. And it was the first time I'd ever spoken publicly about health or anything like that. Um, I'd been speaking, you know, like uh, in the fashion industry and things like that. So it wasn't like my first gig ever, but I remember being so nervous and I went up and did my talk and it was so cool when I <clears throat> was done. I remember coming and sitting down with you. I think David Wolf was speaking right after me, which was really nerve wracking because he's a guy that I've been watching at all these big conferences and stuff from the audience. I'm like, you know, I remember just being kind of mortified, like hoping I did a good job and having this whole imposter syndrome kind of, uh, you know, sense. And uh, and I walked off and and you tapped me, you know, kind of hit me on the uh, elbowed me and, and we're like, hey do you know you could be doing this? Like, why isn't this your thing? And that really was so meaningful to me. It really stuck with me as someone who'd been in the game a long time uh, yourself. So I, you know, I never forget where I came from and I appreciate your, (laughs) I appreciate your encouragement. You know, you probably were just like, Stating something that wasn't a big deal to you, but it really stuck with me. So I, oh, I really remember that really clearly, though. And and a couple of little anecdotes too. Um, first, it's always better to uh, have David Wolf follow the, you than to follow him because he's got that um, mesmerizing charm on an audience that man, you get up after him. And I have a memory of uh, giving a talk at uh, Hot Spring in the Desert, following him. He had had people for like three hours. And I think people really wanted to hear me, but like I came in and it was just like, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and I had to send everybody out for a break for a while, actually, just so they could like reset, you know. Um, But the other thing that's funny is I'm thinking back to that event at Neil's and it was the, I think that was two or three days and it was the wrap up. It was like the final thing. We were all on stage. All the speakers were there together. I think Jack had left, but the rest of everybody was there. And uh, it was kind of a recap. And I remember um, that he was asking like, hey, you know, what do you guys have to sort of, you know, give these guys as a final wrap up? And you went into talking about elimination and it triggered me to start talking about bowel movements. And it was like, not the time. Like that would have made a lot of sense the day before, right? Because that kind of thing was coming up. But I am start talking and then I sort of look around and all the speakers are looking at me like, what are you doing? You know, and Neil looks over and he goes, "Okay, we'll uh, we'll call that taking a vitalis." And I was so embarrassed, man, because it was you know Neil's also like such a charming guy. He's got that sort of magnetism about him, and I just was like, "Oh, I was crushed." And when I look back, it's like one of my most embarrassing memories is is that moment. Yeah, like one of the most embarrassing stage moments I've ever had. That is funny. I f- I don't remember that at all, and I had totally forgotten about that panel that we did at the yeah. end too. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. I just, you know, it was supposed to be like tying a bow on the big picture 50,000 feet. And I like zoomed into toilet level, you know, yeah, <laughs> all the way. Another thing I remember about that, that was also encouraging. And um, I wouldn't share it with any of the other speakers for obvious reasons. But uh, after I spoke with you, when I got off stage, I ran into Jack Cruz, who, whose work I'd been following and didn't have any relationship with him really at that time. And uh, and he pulled me aside out in the hall, I think like midway through David Wolf's talk. And he's like, hey, come here for a second. And, you know, he's very like kind of po- literally like poke you in the chest. He has a right, right. pretty uh, straightforward, if not aggressive communication style. And he said, listen, I just want to tell you something. You and that Daniel guy were the only ones that weren't totally full of shit. This- <laughs> that sounds like Jack. <laughs> just talking all this shit about 
well, you know, I want to talk shit about him, but I mean, you know, he would say it on Twitter right now. He has no qualms right. with like speaking his mind, but I was like, it was, I kind of felt bad because he was in a sense like saying everyone else sucked, but I was glad <laughs> that you and I were included in at we're least in the, we're in his side. <laughs> shit. But you and that Daniel guy, because I, I think, because we were talking about just fundamentally that relationship with nature yeah. and coming from that perspective and, and knowing that we, of course, don't live in a natural world, no matter where we are on the planet at this point. And uh, that was, was, and, and continues to be the basis of all of my shit as weird as it gets into right. the biohacking world. It's, it's all coming back to at least mimicking what would have happened for us and to us living as natural humans. And I know that's yeah. been your perspective and I've learned so much of that from you. So anyway. It's complicated, right? Trying to rebuild the natural environment outside of the environment. Because I've joked with people, you know, if you took all the ingredients, let's say you took like um, everything that we know is in an apple, you know, so you had like malic acid, you know, and you had the amount of water and the amount of vitamin C, you know, and you had all the enzymes that you know are there. You took all the components you put them together, you shake them in a bag. It's not like an apple comes out, right? So you go into the natural world, everything's integrated and very simple. You have the fresh air and the sunlight that creates that reaction in your skin for vitamin D. And you have, you know, the electrical grounding of the earth beneath you and you have the ions and the air, you know, all those things are present. But if you're going to like, I'm going to bring all that into my house, like the, you've, as you know, the amount of stuff and then the the sum is not necessarily like equaling what it is you're trying to recreate, although it helps, but it, it can be. And I've joked with you and we've talked about it on the show, but I have found that a little cumbersome trying to recreate the natural world outside of the natural world. So it makes me think a lot about last night, um, my wife, Ivani and I were watching, we just watched Alien the other night and we watched Aliens, those old Sigourney Weaver movies. So it's 1979 in 1986, when these movies were done. And it's fun to watch sci-fi from the past because it's like 1970s, but we're in space, you know? Like they're trying to project out what technology will be like in the future. It's quite funny. But when I think about people trying to go to space, which, you know, we seem to be looking at projects beyond outer Earth orbit, where our, you know, space station now is just orbiting the Earth. It's not like it's in... I never really think of it as in space. It's not really in space. It's like a plane that's really high up. You know, it's just like a satellite. But if we want to push out past that, the idea of trying to recreate conditions that humans can actually live long term in, and I don't, I don't hear them talking about that either. You know, so it's like, how will that work? We can't even do it here. <laughs> no, I know in our cities, like, how are we going to do that? So I could imagine somebody going on a short term mission, even let's say that, you know, we, we can make it work and you go to Mars and back. But the idea of like staying out there long term and maybe even, you know, reproducing out there, it just is like, we're going to have to become something different if we're going to do that because there are a lot of factors here on Earth that we are adapted and evolved for that we just wouldn't have out there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, like that a mall in space, you know? Yeah, I um I don't know. I don't sometimes when I look at the state of the world uh, affairs, I want to go to another planet. <laughs> <laughs> Space launch the other day. I was like, "Can I go?" cuz <laughs> fucked up. Yeah. Um yeah. I want them to take everyone and I'm going to just stay behind like See you when you get back. <laughs> We're going to be cleaning up down here. Exactly, exactly. Oh man. Um so one thing that is interesting about our prior conversations, the number of times that you've been on the show, I, I think maybe in the very first time you came on, which I believe was episode two, I think you were really my first guest, if I'm not mistaken, because my first show was a solo show where I just kind of introduced oh, cool. myself and told my story. Uh, but we talked a bit about agriculture and uh, you know the state of our food and nutrition and stuff in that first one. But things have evolved. You learned more. I've learned more since then. And I've been always since that time wanting to have an updated conversation, mm. uh, you know, tapping into your knowledge base and just the fundamental um, principles that you understand from the natural world of plant and animal foods and how we derive nutrition from them. And additionally, those things that are now considered supplements that were once considered food, um, speaking yeah. in terms of, you know, the the world of fungi and and herbalism and things that have been historically just part of the human diet. And now we're kind of segregated into what we call a supplement to add into the diet because they're not there anymore and they once were. 
Yeah. And so, that, and of course, too, added to that being that the word supplement is it's such a huge spectrum of things that it can be everything from like now we're seeing supplements at, you know, convenience stores and at Walmart and, you know, stuff that you wouldn't be at your standard. And, you know, so, so some people have that in their head and then, you know, companies like mine that produce really, really high, we're in the supplement industry. I don't like thinking of myself like that, but I wouldn't say I'm in the food industry either. So, you know, that word supplement has some negative connotations along with some positive connotations too. And that's one of the things I've struggled with being in that industry for a while. Yeah. And uh, on that note, I've also... A missing link, I think, in our past conversations has been totally ignoring the fact that you have a really amazing company called Sir Thrival. <laughs> and, and we've I don't even think we've ever touched on it except at the end when I'm like, where can people find your website? Yeah. And um, I, I've always respected that about you. You're extremely classy and non-salesy. But I think... <laughs> as your friend for a few years now, uh, almost to the point of your detriment, because I'm kind of like, dude, like promote your yeah. site. Your shit is awesome. Yeah. I've been using Thank it. You. I don't know, however long you guys have been around, eight years or something. So 10, 10 years now. No, uh, 11, 12 years. Oh, that 12 one? years, man. Yeah. Cool. 12 years. I remember, I think when I first met you was at your booth uh, at one of the long, the, the David Wolf like Longevity Now conferences. And I remember even then I was pretty discerning about you know, supplements and things like that that I was into. And I remember like just looking at your ingredient decks and kind of grilling the brand for efficacy and legitimacy and purity and all that. And I was like, holy shit, these guys are like hardcore. They're doing it right. So I was I was like a fan of the brand, I think, uh, you know, as I started to uncover your work. So yeah. You know, thank you. I'm not, a, I'm not a great marketer of myself. It's uh it's been a challenge over the years because of that, you know how it is. It's like when what I don't like is when you're you're listening to something, you're really grooving with it, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, it's a sales pitch. I thought I was getting clean information, and I don't know how to balance that exactly. Um, I do want to promote my company. I really love my products. In fact, I fall like recently had another like falling in love with my products. Uh, you know, because it's been twelve years. You know, you go through a lot of cycles and stuff. Um, with everything that's been happening lately, I feel like uh, the renewed relevancy of what I do in there in that space. Um, because it's, uh, you know, I do the supplement thing, but then I also teach, you know, in a way that isn't related to supplements. And so, you know, trying to balance those things and now making my show wild fed, doing my own podcast, trying to find an integration point has always been a challenge for me because I don't want to tarnish what I talk about by, by people thinking like, oh, it's a sales pitch. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I relate as a podcast host. Yeah. Many of the people that I want to interview because of their knowledge base, wisdom, yeah. Experience also happen to be associated with a product, yeah. and I also want to support them doing great work and create right. products that are awesome and helping uh, humankind. But also, don't want to have a podcast that sounds like a giant commercial either. So it's mm -hmm. like I don't know. I think the way that I've navigated that is just really focusing on the value and the education piece. And it's like if something is promoted and if it's something that I have an affiliate relationship with, it's in my store. I mean, it's like quite obvious and I state it all the time. Anything in my web store, well, probably 90% of it. If you buy something from that store, I get a small commission, um, which is wonderful. And I feel it's a really integrous business model, affiliate marketing, because the brand wins. They get a new customer, hopefully mm -hmm. for life. Um I win because I'm able to pay my team to produce, you know, higher quality content all the time and keep up leveling that. And of course, like uh, feed myself and, uh, and the customer wins because they're getting educated on what I believe to be the best products. And also in most cases, getting exclusive discount codes and saving yeah. themselves the time of having to like go and vet every product in every category because they don't want to do that. They just want to know like what stuff works, Luke. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not always right, but I do my very best to find the best of the best out there. And once I find something is not the best, then I remove it from my promotions, yeah. actually, um, because I it's happened with like air purifiers. I've promoted... That's an interesting space, right? There's some scammy stuff going on in that. I'm, I'm all about... I just bought three new air filters that are, you know... I don't remember what they cost, 60 bucks a piece or something. And when I was doing my research, it's like, oh, you can spend 2000 on something that has like magical qualities. But when you drill down on what they are, you're like, oh, scam. 
Yeah, well, that happened to me recently. I was, um, I mean, I never really heavily promoted it, but I did some research and it seemed like the kind of the best one on the market, this one called Molecule. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> And I don't know how I stumbled across it, but I came across some website that, you know, it wasn't from a competitor that was saying like, oh, Molecule sucks, but it was an, it seemed to be an independent third party yeah. that tested the claims of how this particular machine worked and, yeah. you know, said that it, not that it was totally worthless, but just that it didn't do everything that it didn't did. do, doesn't do a lot. I watched a great video where what they were doing was they sectioned off a room with plastic so that they had sealed the space and then they burned something in that space you know, that, <clears throat> that they can consistently repeat. So they burn something in that space and they run the air filter in there. And how long does it take to clear the air? So pretty scientific experiment. They just run the different filters in there. And that one did the least of everything that I watched tested, including up against products that were uh, like, a, like a fraction of the cost, you know, a 10th of the cost or something. And so it's really interesting when you, you know, high efficiency particulate air filter, you want something that removes air particles, not just like spits out electricity and kind of like zaps everything in the air. It just doesn't actually work, which is not to take away from ozone machines and all that. I have that too. But uh, it's the problem is that most people don't understand atmosphere and what they're trying to recreate. So going back to what we were saying before about you try to recreate these natural conditions in your house, you got to understand a little bit about what you're trying to create. And uh, unfortunately, like turnkey solutions are are uh, often what ends up happening is you end up getting something that's not really what you think it is. You know? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that one when I when I found that out, just that there was any legitimate skepticism, uh, I just immediately had it taken off my site. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it, I haven't had to do that too many times because usually I really look into something before I put it on there. So mm -hmm. anyway, uh, I think a lot of people that listen to podcasts might not even be aware that how these things are funded is okay. Got you. Sponsors. I think people are starting to get a lot cooler about it because I remember, you know, when I first started podcasting, the space was still pretty young. And now where it's kind of like everybody has a podcast, including let's say like all the news pundits, you know, their shows on cable still, but then it's also a podcast. It's like everybody's in the podcast game. If you have anything public, it's now in the podcast sphere. And I think people are getting used to Sort of like, I remember, you know, when I was a kid watching TV, I wasn't like, oh God, a commercial. Oh my God, now you're trying to sell me something. It was just, you got used to that's how they fund these things. Uh, I think that the really important thing as content creators is that we aren't focused more on selling the product than the content we create. And that's what started to happen. I mean, TV, as, as somebody who's now producing my own show um, and talking to networks from time to time, just seeing that they have gotten so focused on the sales part that they don't think that the quality of the content matters anymore. They're just trying to sell the ad space. And it's like, you, you, you destroy yourself that way. The content has to be really, really good. And then people might buy into you know, your ads. But if you are just running ads and you have crap content, it's like, see ya. Yeah, I think uh, luckily before I started my podcast, I had a, a pretty fundamental understanding of content marketing and that it's it's not based on the old system of yeah. 10, 10 asks to one give. It's the inverse of that. So yeah. it's like nine pieces of value for free asking for one piece of value in return, yeah. you know, whether it be a podcast, a blog, a vlog, that it's way, way, way more giving than asking. And yeah. that and that goes back to that model of reciprocity and fairness and equality for all parties involved so that it, it, it's a win-win. It's more of an egalitarian kind of form of marketing mm -hmm. in that sense. And I'm thankfully, you know, one of the people that's able to participate in that for the time being. And I feel really good about it. Now, would I prefer to not have any ads on my podcast ever? Yeah. But like, it literally <laughs> costs a couple, a few thousand dollars a month to run this shit. Yeah. And including me spending, you know, right. that I spend doing it, which I think people often negate as a, you know, people that are critical of that model, I think negate the amount of time and energy, care and love uh, someone puts into actually creating high quality content. They're just like, oh no, you should work for free. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or, or like the thing where you're like, look, I just need you to leave me a review and a rating on iTunes or whatever. Just please just do that. They're tuning in week after week, three years, 52 times a year. They're listening to you for an hour and they won't even do that one little thing. And then I'll catch myself doing that. 
and I'll hear the person put the call out and I'm like, oh, I'm that person now. I'm, I need to do that too. But uh, yeah, I don't think people understand or... I mean, the, that's, I think we're going to end up with an inverse problem, which is that before, it, like I said, it got to where it was all ads and the quality of content came down. I think what we're going to end up with now is that the expectations for free content are going to be so extreme. You're going to be expected to do so much and ask for so little. We're going to have to figure out how to navigate that part of it. So... Because I mean, as you know, this kind of thing, you look at it from the outside and it looks like such an attractive life. Like, oh, you just, you know, you do a podcast once a week and you, you blog a little bit here and there and put up a social media post. But as you know, you're running on a treadmill every week, all week, just trying to get it all done. Mondays for me are insane. Tuesdays are like, ah. and then by Wednesday, I kind of feel like I start to get control again. But just putting content out and I don't, I don't put out a ton. I put out high quality content. I might post on Instagram once a week, but when I do, I write, you know, three hundred words, and I, and I I really really edit. It's really really clean. That takes time, and it, and then responding to everybody and all of that stuff. It it's people would be surprised. I think at the amount, you know, what a podcast takes to put out, et cetera, et cetera. You know all that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad that uh, that I have the opportunity to do it. I'm very fortunate. In fact, yeah. this morning, you know, and yeah, it is a lot of work, but it's thankfully work that I'm passionate about and. To be honest, I probably would do it for free. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, I got to eat and like, you know, I have different, you know, ways that I make money and I still own my, you know, my other business school of style and there's, you know, great things there and all that. But uh, I would have a conversation with you for a couple of hours, even if it wasn't recorded, asking you the same shit that I'm asking you on a podcast. That's the truth of the matter. Well, as you said before, like I've always been really bad at advertising my own products, which means I've done a lot of this kind of stuff for free over the years. So I can relate. You know, it's the passion for, for me, the one of the most exciting things. uh, I think you have the same kind of uh, kink that I have. It's like if, if I get a new piece of information that kind of overturns a whole bunch of assumptions that I've had in my head, I'm, I'm enthralled by that. Like the idea of like discovery of new information is just like, for me, that's the drug, you know? And then communicating that back out and helping people have... When you see someone have like an aha moment, some of the stuff that I've got to talk about over the years, I've been really blessed like to, for instance, you know, I get to talk about human domestication as part of my job. And when I see that click for somebody and they come to understand like, oh, wow, I've been domesticated like a dog or like a cat or like a cow. And that there are ways that I can reorient myself and how I move through the world with more personal sovereignty. And like you see that click for somebody, I do that for free every single day. I mean, it's so incredible to watch that kind of change. So that's a huge motivator. And, I'm, and I think you can tell when somebody doesn't have something similar where they don't have the same passion for it. You know, they come across with that used car salesman vibe where you're like, no offense to any used car salesman out there. I'm not talking about you, but the stereotype. Uh, But you know, when you feel that vibe, it's really obvious. But when you, you know, when somebody's passionate, you know, you, you feel that. Yeah, that's true. Well, let's go ahead and dive into uh, the topic of choice here. And I mean, because I could just shoot the shit with you forever, but I do have an agenda. Uh, As I stated earlier, uh, let's start out perhaps with the difference in an overview between wild foods and domestic foods that one would get from even the highest quality grocer or even farmer's market. Yeah. Well, nutritional uh, density and the ability to support life. Right. Okay. Well, you know, the the thing that I think is really apparent is the stuff in our supermarkets been produced by people. And it took many, 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 many hundreds of years in most cases for us to draw those things out of nature and turn them into what they are. And I'll go back through and explain what I'm talking about. The foods that we find in nature aren't really uh, necessarily meant to be foods. We live in an ecosystem of all of these organisms who have this desire to reproduce right? To survive into adulthood and to reproduce, spread their genes around, to grow out their niche and to live on planet earth. And every other organism needs to eat one or more of those organisms in order to really be able to stay here and fulfill their mission. So it's not like a grocery store where every organism is like, hmm, how can I produce a food for everybody else? In a lot of cases, they are the food, but then they're also eating things too. So what's happening in the natural world is things are made up of all these nutrients, really high quality nutrients, because that's what they make their bodies out of. 
what's going on with us is that we have culled out of the natural world all of these foods and we've been producing them for years and years and years. And in the process, we've dumbed down their genetics. We've done, dumbed down the amount of nutrition that's in them. We've depleted our soils. We've removed the medicines out of the foods because we, we don't usually like the flavors of those things. And what we have now is a diet that verges on the cardboard. You know, it's like, you know, if you think about cardboard, it's like, it's, it's fiber, it's paper fiber, it's cellulose. That's like what's left over when you run kale through the juicer. Right, you've kind of squeezed out most of the nutrition, and now you just have the fiber. We are eating a diet that's like that. Now you got the the full spectrum from folks who are eating the best quality diet they can to people who don't care. People who don't care are going. You know, let's say you're going to McDonald's every day and you're getting this burger. Looks like a burger, but all the it doesn't. It wouldn't taste like that if they didn't add in all those synthetic flavors. Right? They're adding all these synthetic, synthetic flavor agents. So if you could have the burger without that, it wouldn't taste like a burger. It wouldn't even taste like... It's not any of those things anymore. It's been like sort of manufactured. And as you move up the scale towards higher and higher quality food, you are getting more and more nutrients, but you aren't getting what's in the natural world. So like really good examples would be... Um, let's say that you were to take uh, just a basic salad you know, you're taking like some kind of lettuce. It could be a green leaf lettuce or a red leaf lettuce or iceberg lettuce or romaine lettuce. If you could see the wild plant, first thing you would notice is that wow, the leaves are much smaller. And then if you tasted it, you'd be like, wow, this thing is much more bitter. And then if you broke a leaf, you'd see, oh, it exudes a white latex. This is a different thing. Now, the, the, the lettuce that we eat today comes from that plant but it's, it's lost a lot of these qualities. Well, it turns out those qualities are super medicinal and even drug-like in some cases. So with lettuce, we have like a very subtle opiate replacement. That's kind of fascinating. Wild lettuce was used throughout time all the way back to Egypt as, a, as an opiate replacement. It was used as a sleep agent. It was used to put crying babies to sleep, the latex in lettuce. Now that latex incidentally tastes bitter, so we've bred it out, right? We've removed it by breeding, by breeding the sweetest lettuce with the next sweetest lettuce and continuing to do that until you eventually have something that no longer resembles the wild progenitor. The problem is then you start to be deficient in medicine. This is like just the most fascinating idea to me that we have created a diet through domestication that's so deficient in medicine that we are now having to take all these medicines externally to try to replace what's missing in our diet. But the other thing that happens is um, let's take blueberries as an example. So if you have a wild blueberry, which is going to be you know, the size of a pea, and you have a domesticated blueberry, let's say it's more like the size of a chickpea, right? It's two, three, four times the size. Well, all those antioxidants in the blueberry that, that are the sunscreen that you eat, right? It's a, these antioxidants that get in our bloodstream and actually protect us from UV damage. They protect us from neurodegeneration. They repair DNA, all that kind of stuff. We really need a lot of that. We need that more now than our ancestors did, but we have way less of it now than they did, right? We're dealing with way more significant forces now than they were that are degrading our body. So we really need those things. Well, if you think about the, uh, the small blueberry, it has less internal mass and more skin then if you think about the, the bigger blueberry, it has actually more internal mass and less skin area, which means you have way less of the, the pigment because the amount of skin to meat is, is reduced compared to the smaller one. Also, you're going to have more of the blueberry flavor in the smaller one. Oh, that's all those phenols, all of those plant chemicals that all are nutrients to us, many of which we don't fall neatly into categories like vitamins and minerals. That's a pretty rudimentary understanding of nutrition. We now understand there's all this phytochemistry that we need. Well, that starts to be bred out when we have these domestic plants. So what you end up with is a lot more water, a lot more sugar, but a lot less of the stuff that you need. And we could go on and on like this. The stuff that's in our diet today is, um, I don't want to say nutritionally bankrupt because there are high quality, you know, permaculture operations, organic farming operations and things like that. But almost in every case, if we compare the nutrition of a wild food to a domestic food, we find that the wild food is significantly higher in nutrients that we need, significantly higher in the phytochemistry that is, you know, everything from, you know, UV protective to gene protective to, you know, immunostimulating or immunomodulating or whatever it is, we find that we have all that chemistry that we need. 
And it's really, really reduced in the, you know, food that we grow. And then when we look at animal products, of course, we run into a whole other suite of issues from, um, in particular, I think, is the disease complexes that develop in the animals that are raised for meat in most cases versus wild animals where we see just this very robust health. So I feel like we're feeding on uh, the most corrupted diet ever. And the problem is that the environment around us is the most toxic it's ever been and the most aggressive to us that it's ever been. And so we don't really have what we need to protect us. uh, And we're sort of eating our way into degeneration right now. Thank you for that. And I think the fascinating piece there that stands out to me is how you illustrated that because we've taken the medicine out of food, which if you're talking about vegetables, for example, would be those bitter medicines that require us because of the degradation that naturally ensues as a result to then later go to the doctor and get those bitter prescriptions of those medicines. If you ever, if you chew up any prescription medicine, which I've done um, (laughs) for reasons we won't to this conversation. Um, By the way, if you chew up medicines and put it under your tongue, it hits you faster. Just a side note, but uh, they're always bitter. You know, you take an aspirin, you take any kind of drug, no matter what. I mean, I've never chewed up an antibiotic, but generally speaking, most medicines are bitter. And, uh, and I always say that, All medicines are plant medicines. Ultimately, even if they're synthetic, they're mirroring something from the fungi or the the plant world at some point. That's kind of where science got the idea to begin with, was from the intelligent design in nature. And it's uh, it's crazy what what we've done in that regard. Um, Something I've heard you talk about in the past that's been really fascinating, and you, you just kind of did the diagram of the blueberry, for example, I remember you talking about back in the day how when you go in the grocery store, even you know a ridiculously expensive grocery store like we have here called Erwan, which is kind of the you know the gold standard of health food stores, where you go in and you have ten bucks to spend, and you come out three hundred dollars later. <laughs> uh, you, <laughs> ten bucks will get you the, a smoothie there for sure. <laughs> Um, but you go into, you know, even like a very well curated vegetable section of a grocery store like that. And you think that you're seeing a hundred different vegetables or whatever the number is. But in fact, it's, it's basically like 10, 10 yeah. vegetables that are yeah. kind of, uh, representing themselves individually. So could you break down that a bit for people? Cause I think yeah. we diverse because, well, yeah. that- I ate broccoli today. I ate kale, and tomorrow I'm gonna eat radishes. So I'm getting like a diverse range of vegetables. Yeah, I mean, I think we all understand that we want a lot of variety in our diet, and that's really important. And when we look at indigenous peoples, and let me backtrack a minute, why I bring up indigenous peoples. This is outside of all of the conversations we're having about sort of. It, I'm, it's getting like too sensitive to even say that. So let me just say, when you look at people who hunted and gathered traditionally, who represent the wild type human, the human before agriculture who were living before sort of these artificial foods were created, um, they have tremendous variety in their diet over the course of their year. I like to call myself a modern day hunter gatherer, but in reality, you know, it's like a hobby of mine. Okay. I, um, I still eat food from the supermarket. I still eat food from the farmer's market. I, you know, I don't eat 100% wild foods and, and I don't know anyone that does. And I would, I think that would be really, really cool to be able to do. And every year I have a little, a lot more, I should say, not even a little, like a lot more every year. We eat wild foods in my house every single day. Uh, and not out of some kind of ritual, but because we just, it's what we have on hand all the time. It's always kind of working into our meals, which means that even as a modern day person who grew up eating Velveeta cheese and, you know, <laughs> like, uh, I don't know what else, cup of noodle was one of my favorites. Um, you know, growing up on that kind of standard white bread diet and kind of turning to wild foods as an adult who really didn't grow up with that skill set, even still at this point in the year, we're in um, mid June right now. I have probably eaten more species this year than the average American will have in 10 years. Because the average American is really eating probably about 30 foods max when we talk about them at the genetic level. So um, let's just imagine, for instance, you were um, an eater of dogs. Like that was like your main staple was you ate dogs. And so, you know, today you had a Great Dane for lunch. And then tomorrow night, you're going to have a Chihuahua. 
And then the next day you're going to have a St. Bernard and then you're going to have a German shepherd. And you're like, man, I got a lot of variety in my diet. I should see all these dog breeds I'm eating. And then somebody comes along and they go like, no, man, you're, they're all dogs species, Canis lupus familiaris. They're actually just the same species. You're not getting variety. You're just getting variety of morphology. You know, if you were a cannibal, you could be like, well, you know, I ate a black dude yesterday and uh, I had a a white girl for lunch. And then I had an Asian for breakfast the other day. Like I'm getting a lot of variety, right? It's like, no, we're all humans. We're all the same species, right? Like we have morphological differences that we can point out, but that doesn't change that we're just all human. We're all the same. Does that make sense? Yeah. We go into the supermarket and we go, oh, like, look at all this variety. And what we don't realize is that a lot of these things, like the different races of people or the different breeds of dogs are actually all the same species. So probably the one that stands out the most to me is this plant called Brassica oleracea, which comes out of Europe in the UK. Um, It's a mustard, a crucifer. And if you saw it, you... If you saw it at certain stages and I really pointed it out to you, you might, you might notice characteristics of certain foods you eat, but you probably would just walk by it. But that plant has been bred into a whole bunch of plants today that we think of as being different. So its leaves have been turned into Brussels sprouts. Its leaves have been turned into all of the cabbages, all the different colors of cabbages and types. Um, it's been turned into collard greens. It's been turned into all of the types of kale. Its flowers have been turned into broccoli and cauliflower. That's the same plant. It's just a a mutated flower of the two. Um, It's been turned into uh, the storage organ we call kohlrabi. That's the same plant. Uh, It's been turned into broccolini and broccoli rob. And uh, we could go on and on and on and on. There's actually many more in this one species. So you go into the supermarket and you see them all laid out there. They appear to be all really different sort of in the way that lots of different types of humans look different, tall and short and stocky and thin. And we all look different, but we're all the same species. So that's going on with our foods. Some other examples would be uh, beets are the same plant as Swiss chard. Turnips are the same plant as Napa cabbage, which is not like a true brassica oleracea, but different type. Um, And it's also uh, where we get canola oil. That's all one plant. So when you start to break it down like that, you realize there's a lot less variety. And then also you start to run into problems of overeating one type of plant all the time. So let me give you an example. This month, we have a plant growing here. This is a cosmopolitan plant. That means it's found all over the world. So for those who don't know, the cosmos is my city. That's what cosmopolitan means. So polis refers to a city in cosmos, right? So around the world, we find this plant. It's uh, called bracken fern. And uh, it's quite popular in Korean cuisine. Now, this plant as a fiddlehead, when it's a young fern, we take the shoot of it, it contains a carcinogen. And we need to leach that out in order to turn it into food. Otherwise, it's a bit toxic. Now, there's always going to be traces of it, and that's okay. But we don't want to overeat this plant over time. And in fact, it's, it might be related to certain stomach and throat cancers in Korea where it's consumed really regularly. So we can tolerate stuff that's toxic to us if we are uh, you, if we have a lot of variety in the diet because we never end up with too much of it. But one of the things that's emerged about Brassica oleracea is it has a goitrogen in it. It damages the thyroid gland. Now that's okay if we don't eat it every single day, all day. But if every day you're eating kale and then collards and then cabbage and then broccoli and then Brussels sprouts and then cauliflower and you keep eating this vegetable over and over, particularly if you eat it raw over and over like the kale salad and the cauliflower rice or you know all the stuff people are doing, they're over consuming a goitrogen. So in nature, what we're doing is we're constantly shifting from food to food to food seasonally. Um, this is called phenology, right? Because phenology is the study of the cyclic changes in the seasons, particularly how it rates, relates to plants, animals, fungi, and other organisms. So for me, this plant bracken fern is only available for about a month, which means that even if I ate it all the time, eventually it's gone and I'm on to the next food. Now, nature had that kind of built in for us. But now, because we have the ability to grow our food all over the world where there's always a climate that can produce it, and we're able to create artificial conditions, we can eat the same foods every single day. So in addition to the problem that you have with 
um, just a lack of variety. You also have the problem that in that lack of variety, you might be over, you might be missing out on a whole bunch of nutrients by not having variety. And then you might be over consuming something that's not really that good for you in too much quantity. Um, just to kind of finish out that thought from before, you know, you have a lot of alliums, which are fantastic. I'm a huge fan of alliums, you know, but you have your onions, your leeks, your garlic, your chives. This is just like this one family of plants. It looks like a bunch of variety out there. Same with citruses, the same with our apples. And then it also gets weirder because a lot of these things aren't even natural born, but they're clones. And so clones have been part of our diet for a really long time. All the weed growers out there know that. That's probably 97% of the people listening right now, I think, in this country are professional weed growers at this point. I know my state, and that's about all they're doing now. Um, so you understand about this cloning idea. Um, it's kind of strange to me that we've been living on clones. So one of the things that's really neat about wild foods, or when you start to ask yourself how you can replicate a wild diet in, in the urban environment, is looking at this question of like, hey, can I get foods that haven't been cloned? Wow, that's really interesting how that all, yeah, exactly, how that all works. Uh, and I'm glad that we got to get that information out of you because I've tried to explain it to people and I'm just not that good at it. And you're have a very eloquent and informed way to communicate that. So the thing that I find interesting just subjectively is uh, in regard to eating a variety of foods, as you've indicated that humans have evolved to do. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that in certain places, uh, you know, the Inuits might not have eaten many vegetables, you know? Yeah, but they, they, a surprising amount of them. I just actually want to interject that. So when you look at people of the North, so Inupiat and Inuit and such, they, they have a 24 hour sun period for a part of the year. And so there's a growing season. Right. So during that time, they're eating, you know, the crowberries and the cloudberries, and they're able to gather algae, marine macro algae. And there's, there's all kinds of plants that they're able to access. We imagine them only in their winter period, which is a mistake, right? That comes from a, just a crazy caricature of who they are. Uh, there's a documentary series that is just incredible. I really like watching it, uh, particularly in the winter, but it followed, it was made, I think in the 1940s or 50s when there were Inuit people who still had, uh, there's no metal in this show. Everything that you see in this series is their traditionally made tools and garments. So they're wearing polar bear pants and seal skin coats and, and, you know, bone harpoons and all. I mean, it's incredible to watch. And it goes through their foraging year. And you're like, oh yeah, it's only winter half the year. They have uh, this period of time where it's all 24 hours of light and they're able to do things that you wouldn't normally think about. So they do have extremely reduced access to resources. Uh, and that's one of the things about... But, but you know, they have more variety still than the average person would. And some of the things that they can eat, you wouldn't necessarily think of like there's the lichen that we call... And you know, just a little side note about lichen. I did a podcast on this recently. Are you familiar with what I mean when I say lichen? Uh, some kind of sea vegetable? Lichens are um, this really interesting composite organism that you'll see growing on rocks as a crust. You'll see them on trees as like a sort of rosette. Um, sometimes they're hanging down from trees as filaments. These organisms, um, they don't fit neatly in any category, but they are part fungi, part algae, and sometimes part um, blue-green algae as well, or cyanobacteria. So they are multiple organisms that work together in order to become one organism. It's quite strange and category-defying. Um, anyway, they're not usually very edible to us, but caribou eat a, a species of it, and the Inuit hunters would then eat the contents of the stomach of that animal where it had been pre-digested. So in cases where you might think like they would have a reduced access to non-animal foods, there are it, rather ingenious ways in which they would get them. Now, keep in mind, as you go toward the equator, you kind of have an opposite issue. Now you have, rather than this really extreme summer to winter thing that's going on, right? 24 hours sunlight, 24 hours of darkness that you'd have there. As you go to the equator, as I'm sure you're aware, it's just 6 a.m. sunrise, 6 p.m. sunset. It's 12 hour day, 12 hour night, 365 days a year. The sun just goes like direct overhead, right? It's the strangest thing to me to be down there. You have so much plant life there 
that your acts, I mean, you look at the, um, the shamanic traditions of, let's say the Amazon jungle. I think you've probably been down there for some of that and experiencing a little bit of that. Um, the amount of plants that they have access to and are in their pharmacopoeia compared to if you went and worked with Inuit people where their shamanism is going to be based on much more, it's going to be much more animal based, right? Because they, they simply don't have that incredible plethora. Why I bring this up is just to say human beings are really unique in that we are so cosmopolitan that we can't really pin down the natural human diet as one thing. I would, I personally think like if I was from the North, if I was an Inuit person or an Inupiat person, I would find veganism sort of offensive where it's like, hey man, uh, we've been around uh, up there for 14,000 years and uh, we can't be vegan up there. Similarly, if I lived in the Amazon, I think I would find, I would be like slightly turned off by the whole like uh, carnivore diet where it's like, hey man, uh, we live in the jungle. There's a lot of plants down here. Then we've been doing this a lot longer than your diet's been around. You know what I'm saying? So people love to do this thing where they go like, oh, the natural diet for people is veganism. Like, oh, the natural diet. We're naturally carnivores. It's like, no, <laughs> we're not. Human beings have been dispersed around the world for tens of thousands of years, right? Out of Africa, how long ago? I mean, I can't remember exactly. It changes all the time. But I think that they know that the folks in uh, Australia, the Aborigines of Australia have been there like 60,000 years out of Africa. 60,000 years. I mean, that's a pretty long time to be adapting to the landscape, right? So coming in and being like, no, no, we figured out the human diet. It's like, uh, you know, you maybe want to ask some of these folks first because they probably have a better handle on it just given the multiple zeros and, and commas in the number of years that they've been out there. Um, but yeah, the human diet's hard to pin down. But what we know is that humans basically eat anything in the environment they can render edible unless they have a taboo against the food. Wow. And I'll, I'll just say like as a hunter for me, here, here's something interesting. Uh, I don't have a lot of taboos. Like if it could be done sustainably, I would go whaling. Just, as, just putting that all the way out there. If it could be done sustainably, I would hunt elephants. You know, as, as I know people are like, oh my God, I'm losing my freaking mind. Ah, how can you say that? But it's like, hey man, I come from mastodon hunters and so do you. you know, like a, a lot of us have mastodon hunters, elephant hunters in our lineages. Now that's how we're here today. Now today, hunting elephants is not a sustainable thing. You know, I, this isn't something I'm saying I would be involved in today. But, but I'm just saying I don't have a lot of qualms about it. But I cannot hunt a crow, man. I don't know what it is. I bought a bunch of decoys. There's a little crow season here in Maine, and I thought like I'm going to hunt crows because there's a window of time where I can't really hunt. And I thought oh, that'd be really cool. But it's like I have like a taboo against it. I want to. I've tried, but it's like ah, oh, there's something about that animal that I'm like I, I just can't for some reason. And it's not about being grossed out by it. It's about like some emotional connection to it. So you'll see that in a lot of cultures where there's certain things they don't eat, but not because they're nutritionally bad for them. Because you'll go to another culture and they eat those there. So what we see is that there are taboos, but otherwise people eat everything, everything. And the challenge that we're having today is we live in an environment where not everything you can eat is good for you anymore. That's the problem. So it's kind of like if you've ever traveled in a place where people are in a transition from a nature-based economy to a industrial economy, you know, we sometimes call it the third world or the developing world or something like that. When you're in a place like that, you'll see like a propensity towards littering that seems really bizarre. Like, why would you litter all this stuff like right in your own village and right along your own streets? But it's like, you think about the past when everything you threw on the ground decomposed or biodegraded back into the landscape. Wow. Now we're in this environment where the stuff that we have doesn't do that anymore, but the habits of 100,000 years of being able to do that are still in place. Similarly, we're in this environment now where if you find something, see in the past, if you found something sweet, you ate all of it. You don't pass up sweetness. You find fat in the environment, you don't pass that up. Like these are really, those two things, sweet and fat are crucial. Same with salt. Especially if you weren't a coastal people, very easy to take uh, salt for granted if you're a coastal people, right? It's like in the water. But if you're an inland people, those salts are missing in your diet. So anytime you find something salty, it's like you eat that. Well, here we are now in this environment just loaded with fat, loaded with sugar, loaded with salt. We still have 300,000 year old taste buds and 
organoleptic experiences in the mouth that go like, oh, I need more of that. I need more of that. I need more of that. So your ancestors going, yeah, get more of that. But the problem is we have too much of it and we've twisted it. So we don't just have our regular cis fats anymore. Now we have trans fats we have to think about, right? We don't just have natural like fructose or glucose anymore or sucrose. Now we have these like high fructose corn syrups and agave nectars and things like that. So in, we have toxic versions of the sweets and the fats and the salts, and we have too much. But this stuff all comes from a natural desire. Uh, I think that's important to bring up because I think a lot of times people feel really guilty. And it's like, oh man, well, if you think about it, you don't have to feel guilty. You just have to learn self-control around these things and figure out a relationship to it. It's kind of like um, how it is with you know, alcohol in our culture. Because you know, historically, we find that people are really interested in alcohol if they can make some, but they usually couldn't make it very frequently because they didn't have access all year to the things that could be fermented until agriculture started. And then suddenly you had like wheat. You're like, what can you turn wheat into? Beer. Or it's like, oh, we're planting vineyards. Well, can we turn grapes into wine, right? You, you suddenly can produce alcohol. We start farming bees. What can you do with honey? Well, you can make mead. So now we're in this environment where we always have access to alcohol. So I'm always fascinated. I read about sometimes what was going on in the desert Southwest with the uh, saguaro cactus, you know, this iconic cactus down there and its fruits. And there would be like a wine that would be produced from the fruits in the season. And there would be like a three day just drinking bender that would go on with the tribes there, making it into a wine and drinking it till it was gone. But then it's gone and you got 360 days probably, 340 something days or whatever it is until it's around again. So you get this like nice window of sobriety, right? But now everybody has to figure out what's my relationship going to be to ethanol environment in my environment? What's my relationship going to be to the drugs in my environment? Because they're so readily available. So we're in this, we, we're, we're, we've carried our ancient tastes for things and our cravings for things that were good into a world where there's too much and too many twisted versions. And that's the problem. The problems aren't really us. The problem is the environment we've created for ourselves. Dude, holy shit. <laughs> that was so dope. Wow. Wow. I got to process that for a second. So being someone who was um, dependent on alcohol, and let's just blame it on the fact that there was too much around. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for for many years, to the point of you know, almost to my demise, uh, amongst other medicines that were around, um, that were very prevalent too. I wonder what poppy seasons are like. Uh, but anyway, um, when, <laughs> prior, they seem to grow a lot of poppies in Mexico all the time. So <laughs> in Afghanistan too. Funny how that works. But uh, it's interesting. Oh, we had troops there, but I guess somehow they're still able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Um, yeah flourishing nonetheless. But it's interesting to think about historically alcoholism in relation to that concept that you just brought forward. I wonder if alcoholism was virtually non-existent or extremely rare prior to uh, the agricultural revolution when we became sedentary and claimed plots of land and started to grow shit year round that we could make booze out of. I wonder if it's just like, was a non-issue historically prior to that that pivot that humankind made. I'd like to expand on that idea that you have there. Um, I mean, it's funny too, when you look at, have you ever seen uh, the show Human Planet? Did you ever watch that? Sort of like, um, it's like a David Attenborough style documentary series, but instead of being about animals, it's about homo sapiens. So it's an anthropological following in that nature documentary style, looking at tribes of people around the world. And there's a fantastic episode um, taking place in the jungle where um, this guy is going to go get honey, um, pull down honeycomb for his family. But I mean, he's something like 80 feet up a tree. So precarious. I mean, you're watching this climb and it's like, you know, I'm, I don't know if you watched that free solo documentary. Did you see that? That dude who I'm the only climbed one. Cap? Seen that yet. Okay. I'm, a, I'm not a heights person. So when I watch that, it's like my, my heart's in my you know, throughout the whole time. And so this is like that. This guy's climbing this tree, but then when he gets all the way up there, he's now got to take his ax and cut a hole into the tree to start pulling out honeycomb and bringing it down to the, his wife and kids who, and village friends who are down below. Uh, and he's, of course, being stung. I think you might have like a smoking, you know, a little bundle of firebrand smoking or something. But you're just looking at this like, okay, you're not making meat every day. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So, um, but I want to add, there's, um, there's a question that exists in anthropology, which goes unanswered. And it's not just, you know, kind of uh, obscure folks who are thinking about this, you know, Jared Diamond, who wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel, he's quite a celebrated uh, writer on anthropology. It's question two, uh, why did we ever leave um, hunting and gathering for agriculture when agriculture actually brings with it so many problems, health problems, social justice problems, um, phys- physiological problems to include arthritis and back pain and all the things that come associated with working the land as opposed to foraging, which is a really gentle, fun activity. I mean, foraging, like, you know, I'm foraging all the time. You go out with my wife, you know, we, it is the funnest and most diverse activity. You know, like CrossFit's harder on your body. <laughs> you know, it's pretty gentle and it's diverse in how you move. And sometimes we're grabbing stuff high and sometimes we're grabbing stuff low and sometimes we're paddling and it's always different, right? So you're not getting repetitive stress problems, but you start like turning soil over every single day. Now you start getting the back problems and all those kind of things. So there's been a lot of questions like, why did we do that? Well, from what we understand currently, the very first domesticated food was wheat um, in Mesopotamia. That's where the first the first crop that was domesticated out by Gobekli Tepe. Um, Personally, you know, just as a side note, uh, for anybody who's kind of followed along any of that Graham Hancock stuff or watching any of that on Rogan, where they're ta- always talking about Gobekli Tepe and trying to figure out what this place was, you know, in my mind, this was the beginning of agriculture happened there. From from my sort of analysis of the research that's been done, of course, from you know my armchair, I'm not over there and looking at this stuff. But um, what's really interesting about that site is that it was built by hunter gatherers. And previous to that, we didn't think hunter gatherers ever built these, you know, city states, these, these citadels like this. We thought only agricultural people did. Well, it turns out that wheat was domesticated like 20 miles down the road. And what I, my kind of hypothesis is, is that wheat was initially domesticated to feed the slaves that were building that site. You know, that's kind of how that, that's how I analyze that. Um, we started planting wheat over there. I say we, I mean humans here. Start planting wheat there. And everybody assumes like, oh, wheat, food, bread. And it's like, well, get it wet and leave it in a bowl for a minute because then it's beer. And there's an argument being made amongst some anthropologists that it might have been the desire for alcohol that actually fueled domestication as much as having surplus food. Because hunter-gatherers had food, right? But like, um, if you've ever drank sake, you're drinking the fermented product of rice grains. If you've ever drank, uh, what's, uh, what is it in, in Mesoamerica that they make out of maize? I'm trying to think of it out of chicha. I, you know, and being down in, in Peru, I'd go to these chicha bars at night where these women were fermenting corn in basically big rubber made garbage cans and giving you this chunky, funky alcoholic porridge, right? So that's coming from maize. Uh, Polke, I think from, um, I want to say from agave, don't quote me on that. Um, Wheat, of course, beer. So what it looks like is if you look around the world, domestication might have been, alcohol might have been the reason for domestication as much as anything else. So I kind of have this um, sentiment that, civilization. And let me back up. Civilization, uh, we use it today to just refer to like things being orderly, but civilization has a really specific definition. It refers to agricultural peoples who build city-states. So when Europeans came to North America, for instance, for the first time, they weren't encountering um, significant city-states. Now that did exist in Mexico and it did come up through the um, Mississippi Valley, there were some city states there, pretty significant ones. But when they came up to places like where I live in New England, for instance, these were mostly hunting and gathering peoples with very limited agriculture. We don't call those civilizations. We, we, they're societies, but not civilizations. So a civilization would be Greece, would be Rome, would be, you know, um, England would be what the Chinese dynasties, those are civilizations where you have a hierarchical structure with somebody ruling at the top and you have these different classes. That's a civilization. Okay. So I have this, this thing I say, civilizations and alcoholic. 
And that's because from the very beginning of civilizations, they were fermenting the grains that they grew. So civilizations and grains are, are deeply intertwined. Grains are the fruits of grasses. So again, if you think about the fruits of grasses that we grow, it's corn, wheat, um, barley, um, rice. All of those are very easily converted because of their carbohydrates. They're very easily converted into alcohol. So it is, going back to what you just said, it's highly likely that alcoholism was really not an issue. And again, when you look at um, hunting and gathering peoples of North America, for example, it's kind of well understood they have a very strong sensitivity to alcohol because they didn't have a genetically they had encountered nearly as much of it as people who had uh, created these city-states where they had all these grains that they could ferment. So Europeans came over and they were like, yeah, we've been drinking forever. <laughs> like, what's up? <laughs> right? And native people were kind of decimated by alcoholism because they didn't have um, the kind of resistance to it. Right? They hadn't developed the ability to process it. You know, because your body goes through a fairly complex process of turning ethanol into vinegar. That's how you, that's how you detoxify it. So it's not like, for instance, like you probably know this. If you take um, psychedelic mushrooms, right? And you urinate and you re-drink your urine, like you re-expose yourself to the psilocybin that's in there. That's a traditional thing people would do, right? Have you ever heard of that? No, dude. Bum. Okay, anyway. <laughs> you can get a bump. Let's just say that. But if you drink alcohol, it's not like you pee alcohol out. You, pull, you pee out vinegar. It's acetic acid. So that's what you break it down into. So anyway, you can imagine in, in places where they had been fermenting grains for a long time, they, their livers got good at that process. right? And so you, know, you see when indigenous groups, particularly like um, in places where people hadn't been previously contacted and then they come in contact with civilizations and then those civilizations give them alcohol, it can have a pretty intense effect on them. Wow. Damn, that's wild. It also... But yeah, I mean, really think about it, like domestication and alcohol. Like that's probably, that's probably the reason. Right, right. And an interesting element uh, in terms of those civilizations being centered around the discovery of uh, our ability to grow food in one place and stay there, as you started to indicate, was that uh, the hierarchical system of very few at the top controlling the many at the bottom, to me is kind of, it's the, it's the link uh, or the, how do I explain it? It's like, I mean, coming from like, you know, this Friday will it will it will have already aired by the time your show comes out. But David Icke is on my show who talks a lot about this. You've already sat with him and recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he talked about unconditional love and consciousness for the first hour or something. You know, yeah. it's not going to be as controversial as one might think. More of a metaphysical teaching, but of course, you know, people like him, even people that are kind of less conspiratorial, you know, uh, have indicated that really so many of the problems we face. Um, as a human culture and uh, and society at large stems from that original domestication and the need for then a police state, a military force, you know, all of the ills that we see today being played out can kind of be traced back to that time yeah. when humans decided this is our land. It's just, it's so interesting. And I'm not... If you, that, it's, you, you have to... Sorry, go ahead. No, that's it. Uh, you have to, th it's a very delicate needle to thread to talk about some of these components. But right now, the conversations that are happening, you know, in the United States and at large about how society should be shaped, this unfortunately, this anthropological understandings of our origins is not being factored into the conversation. So it's the obvious elephant in the room to me watching it from the outside as this conversation takes place. Um, particularly around you know things like policing and all of that, because if you, you it's hasn't been done before to have a civilization that sees its individual citizens as sovereigns. The closest that that's ever you know the closest experiment to that is the United States with its Bill of Rights and Constitution. I mean, my wife's from Canada; it's an amazing place. I mean, they don't have free speech there; they don't have a right to assembly there; they don't have, they don't have a Second Amendment there. I mean, the idea of those things is a really, really new idea. Um, but we still don't have we still have that structured hierarchical society. It's just a, a it comes into existence when you have surplus food. Um, just so people you know catch everyone up to what we're talking about here. It's like 
if you are a hunter gatherer, you um, typically, you can only produce as much food as you eat because it's like you have to go out each day and hunt and gather that food and bring it back. Now, that doesn't mean it's all immediate return subsistence. In other words, it's not like you just go out, catch something, bring it back, eat it, and the next day you wake up hungry and you got to go out again. Obviously, a lot of cultures learn to store food and process food into things that they could keep on hand, but it was very difficult to produce surpluses of food. But when you do agriculture, you end up with surpluses of food. See, going back to Gobekli Tepe, here's the thing. They knew it took like 500 people working for, I think it was five to 10 years in order to build that site. 500 people around the clock. Well, how'd they feed those people? Well, in order to feed those people, if you're hunter-gatherers, means that every hunter 500 hunter-gatherers have to produce twice as much food. That's not realistic. Hence why I think that the, the growing of wheat in that place probably was used to fuel that workforce. When you start to domesticate grains, you start to produce surplus food, which leads very quickly to surplus people. And that's one of the things. It's like if you take a a tank full of mice and you put enough food in there for 100 mice, you're always going to have right around 100 mice. But if you suddenly add to where there's enough food for 200 mice, how long till you have 200 mice? Not going to take that long. The population will... This is why there's a huge fundamental misunderstanding amongst most folks. If you ask the average person on the street, are they, you know, is there enough food being grown in the world for all the people that are here? Most people think no. And I'm always like, well, then what are all these people made out of? Just straight up, what are they made out of? Good luck? <laughs> They're made out of food. Therefore, we must be producing surpluses of food if we keep growing the population, if we're going to get to 12 billion people, it's because there's too much food. I mean, if you just scaled the food back, you would have less people. It would take a little time, but the population would, would diminish to the amount of food that's available. Is that making sense? Soon as you have surpluses of food, you get surpluses of people. So one of the things that happens when they first started to grow food was you had this surplus of food, so the population starts to explode. The other thing that happens is now you're not on a migratory circuit where you, you follow these animals at this time of year, you go over here to forage this at this time of the year, then you got to move over to this river because that's where the fish run that you harvest at that time of the year. And you end up with this migratory cycle. I experienced that in my own hunting and gathering where it's like each part of the year, I'm in a different place for a different food. That just happens naturally. But what happens with agriculture is you become sedentary. You stop moving around because you're going to all be hoarded around your wheat plantation, whatever it is you're growing or your livestock or whatever it is. So you now you stay put. Well, because you're staying put, you can't let anybody else come there. So real quickly, it's, this is my land, right? So now what do you, how are you going to keep anybody else from there? Well, now you need some kind of class of people who are going to protect that, right? So now you need kind of like armies and then you have surplus food. Well, who decides who gets the surplus food and how it's distributed? Because surplus food starts to work like a money. So how does that work? Well, now you need some class of accounting. Well, who's going to watch over them? Well, now you need some kind of ruling class, right? And like legislative class and all this. Before you know it, you're in this hierarchy. So right now, we're seeing this rebellion against the hierarchical systems, which is understandable because hierarchical systems aren't natural to humans. But the problem is no one's addressing the fact that they want to erase hierarchy, but still have all the conditions that lead to hierarchy. So it's going to be really difficult to just trust everybody to just handle everything. There's not going to be any crime and there's not going to be any, you know, I mean, how's that going to work? Because those are the reasons that hierarchy came into existence. I don't believe that hierarchies are good for the soul. <laughs> you know, you look at, um, how hunter-gatherer peoples lived and they had an incredible degree of egalitarianism beyond anything that we can even really conceive of today, right? Where each person really is a sovereign, where the person who is in a leadership position is in a leadership position, but they don't have authority over you. You go along with it because you agree and think they're a good leader, but not because you have to, right? It's a very, that was a very different world that we lived in for 300,000 years. We've only been living like this for five to 10,000 years. This is all very new to us. But the idea that we're not going to discuss these conditions that lead to hierarchy and we're going to try to abolish hierarchy, it's a fool's errand. So sitting on the outside watching people and watching the conversation that's taking place right now, it's like, it's hard when you know there's missing details, that the conversation's incomplete. And uh, until we really address where we come from, and, th and that's the thing is there's such a push today too to like erase the past. And that, that's a delicate thing. You kind of need to know the past 
in order to make good decisions about the future. And I think we need to be really careful about that because learning from the mistakes of the past is really important. So uh, yeah, I think that we're having a half conversation about a lot of these things and it's not really productive. Um, we need to ask ourselves why hierarchy exists, not just how to abolish it, you know? Wow. And, in, and, and we're going to have to really reflect on where our food comes from because that's what people don't understand that hierarchy and food. Po- all right, let me put it another way. Policing and food are so intertwined. It might sound ridiculous to somebody if you just bring it up like, oh, policing and food are intertwined, but it's like policing emerges out of agriculture and the desire to protect the labor that you put into the ground. <laughs> Damn, dude, totally unexpected turn, but that is really fascinating. Yeah, that's wild, man. That's wild. I love talking to people that have a an under a basic understanding of of history. Uh, I find that that particular uh, area of interest seems to be fading generationally. You know, it's like we get so myopic because we're so inundated with uh, with data and. Yeah. and events. And we have so many different forms of media flying at us that just trying to keep up with what's going on right now is so um, energy and time consuming. Uh, who really has time to go, hey, I wonder what it was like 20,000 years ago. I mean, it's a specialized, you know, minute group of people that for whatever reason have a curiosity and a vested interest in, yeah. in, in looking backward. Right. But I think that's really uh, sage, sage advice for everyone to, um, to examine that. Um, going into the question I was going to kind of ask before when we were talking about the food uh, element and the diversity of what we eat, and then I want to get into some of uh, some specific, because I know you've like kind of honed in on some of your favorite nutrient dense, uh, you know, herbs, foods, and things like that. But in terms of the diversity and the, you know, extremism of like, uh, you know, being a carnivore or vegan or whatever it is, uh, I personally am not you know, in line with kind of following any trend, but I can't solve this particular riddle and maybe you can. I feel the absolute best if I just eat beef every day and pretty much don't eat anything else. (laughs) And I'm not a carn I'm not like on the carnivore diet or anything. I do eat other stuff. I just noticed like, why do I have a runny nose? And then I think, well, what have I been eating? And I go, oh yeah, I had some of this or some of that. It's like, or joint pain, or I don't know. It's almost like I get the sense that some of us, maybe myself included, have in some ways become kind of allergic to foods, maybe because of so many years of a lack of diversity that now we're kind of like in this lane where the less diverse our food is, the better we feel. And that's definitely true for myself. Like I don't I feel great if I... Let, let me ask you this. Yeah. Because I know you like to do therapy here on the show. If this was 10 years ago or 12 years ago or 15 years ago, would there have been a moment where you could have been on a show like this telling somebody how when you don't eat meat at all and you just eat vegan, you don't know why, but I'm just saying I feel way better. I don't get runny noses and I feel like I don't have joint pain. Like were you ever... Have you ever... Has this ever come out of your mouth? But in reference to if I don't eat meat and only eat plants... Because you're saying exactly what vegans say. I know, I know. Well, here's the thing. My experience of my you know, 10 years or so as a vegetarian, uh, I actually never felt good. And I had even more... Not even in the, not even the really beginning? Because I felt great in the beginning. In the beginning, I did, but that's when I was getting sober, and so you know, I'm coming off confounding li- factors. I'm I'm coming off a diet of like malt liquor, crack, and heroin with an occasional <laughs> dominoes. You know what I mean? So it's like <laughs> being a vegetarian and kind of understanding to start eating organic food and juicing and things. Yeah, I mean, I felt better, but my point of reference was like at the gates of death. So. Anything would have been a step up, and I'm, you know, yeah. I'm not trying to be sensational. I mean, it's just the way it was in my 20s. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there was a period of starting to detox and do colonics and try some herbs and juicing and you know, making my own kombucha and doing saunas and all the things. Kind of in the in the late 90s that I got into, my health improved, but then it definitely flatlined, and there were things that just persisted. You know, just pesky physical issues, digestion, skin, sleep, whatever that I just, energy, anxiety, depression, whatever that I couldn't overcome until I really started going down the kind of more hardcore committed biohacking path that I, you know, I started on a few years ago. 
Um, but I, I don't know. I've, I'm just curious about that. Like yeah. why, if I eat a bunch of kale or something, I, I'm probably going to like have a sore elbow the next day or, <laughs> you know, it's just weird. Or even like, yeah. it, you know, what really, really messes with me is if I eat, well, gluten for sure. And it just does not. That's kind of its own story, which we can address, but I've done whole shows about that, which people can find. But I find even if I eat like not, if I eat gluten free stuff, that's like fake grains meant to taste or, you know, have a mouthfeel of gluten that that almost fucks me up as bad as real gluten. So it's like, I pretty much every day, you know, my girlfriend would be like, honey, you want a salad or some of this fruit or this and that? I'm like, you know, I, I I bought a quarter steer from a, a local rancher that's humane and grass fed and pastured and just amazing ranch up um, north of Bakersfield. And I went and picked it up, and it's in my garage in a freezer, part of my kind of doomsday prepping thing. Oh yeah, actually, I remember I I uh, reached out to you for some advice on a chest freezer. Thank you for that. I got one, yeah, smaller one too. You know, um, but yeah, every day, you know, I'm just like, I don't know, honey. I think I'm just gonna you know grill up some you know, a steak or some meat. And I I tend to just feel less inflamed and I have energy and I sleep well and I just, I feel balanced. But at the same time, I'm like no natural human from which I have evolved in my European mutt self would have ever just eaten cows all the time. (laughs) Right, right. That working for me, it's just weird. I don't, I don't think about it too much. But, but, But how long is your sample size of time too? Because that's kind of what I'm trying to get at from before is, is, Typically, if you put somebody on any kind of restrictive diet for a period of time, they're going to have a lot of really positive results. And then down the road, uh, and this is why I was bringing up vegans, or raw foodists, or whatever, is is the typical cycle goes, I feel amazing, I feel amazing, I feel amazing. Now I'm just in the habit of saying I feel amazing, but I'm starting to get symptoms. I'm ignoring the symptoms, still telling people I feel amazing. And then eventually you are writing me, DMing me on Instagram to say, hey, how do I come out to my followers that I'm not vegan anymore? <laughs> you know what I mean? I get a lot of those folks. So I, I, don't, I think that, that that might be how you feel today, but it'll be interesting to see if in 10 years, you're like, no, man, it's weird. I still just feel great if I just eat cows. Because like, how long has that been? Um, also... I know that's a very popular trend right now. Again, when we look at people around the world who had very restricted access to plants, we still see them eating as many... It would be interesting for you to come hang out here and eat some wild plants and see how they impact you. I think that... um, And I know that there's folks out there right now who are promoting this idea of like no fiber in your diet. I just think this is really dangerous territory because your microbiome really depends on your fiber intake. And our fiber intake is at its lowest that it's ever been. Um, it's just absurd to me, the idea that you don't need fiber. And I'm not saying that you can't live, survive that, but I, don't, I personally just don't see it now. That doesn't mean that there's not a lot of inflammatory foods in the um, supermarket vegetables that you're eating, particularly things that might be high in omega-6 fats. And you might be sensitive to that. Or like you brought up gluten, which is like just... It's not that there hasn't been gluten in wheat all along. The wheat, the wheat that people eat today is, was, was made through gamma radiation bombardment in the earliest days of genetic engineering before we had CRISPR technology and gene splicing stuff that we can do today. What they were doing is just taking wheat seeds and blasting them with gamma radiation to cause genetic mutations and then growing it and seeing what they got. And they ended up producing the dwarf wheats that we have today with their very high gluten contents because that glute, that glue is the stuff that binds together all the stuff that we like wheat for. And so we've produced a sort of a Franken wheat. Um, now everybody goes around talking about how bad grains are, but it's like, man, I don't know, come out in the canoe wild ricing with me and try that grain because that's a grain, a wild one, and it doesn't have those effects on you. you know. So um, I don't know. I can't speak to what your personal physiological experience is, but I'll be interested to see year by year by year if that holds to be true or if you find yourself where most human beings find themselves, which is like, hey, if I have like a little bit of meat on my plate and like some steamed vegetables and some raw vegetables, it's like, oh, that all kind of comes together to be a really holistic approach where I still get the proteins and the aminos that I need, right? But I'm also in the vitamin D and the vitamin A and the vitamin K and all these things that are poorly represented in plants. But I'm also getting all that phytoprotection because here's the thing, like you live in in the LA area, right? So, or Southern California. So uh, when you eat beef, you're not getting any... Um, you're not getting UV protection. You're not eating your sunblock. 
right? You're not getting that glutathione boost. Um, you're not getting that uh, superoxide dismutase that's going around helping to repair genetic damage that's happened from environmental toxins. So those things might take some time to emerge for you, the symptoms of that. But I, I, I'm suspect. I'm suspect of, of this approach. Uh, but I've tried the approach too. So I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I, I say that from having tried it. Yeah, well, I well, I am too because again, I look back and I go, eh, this, you know, it makes sense because I feel pretty good and not, you know, that's not, I'm like I said, I'm not carnivore. I mean, I eat salads and spirulina and wild blueberries. I mean, I eat all kinds of other stuff. I just notice like if I get a flare up of any kind of symptom, yeah, it seems to coincide with me having more diversity. And and it would also be interesting to really, really like specifically look at it to where it's like. Um, there's one thing like if you kept a food log versus like what you tell yourself in your head you had. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like if you could really peer into what you had because a lot of us aren't... Well, a lot of... We're, you know this, man. We're so good at lying to ourselves. It's incredible. It's incredible our ability to sort of deceive ourselves. Like, no, I, I had kale today. It's like, really? Just kale? Like what else? Oh, well, it was actually kale chips. Okay, it was kale chips. What was on the kale chips? Well, like an uh, exorbitant amount of salt and nutritional yeast. Oh, nutritional yeast. Where'd they get that yeast from? Did they scrape it off the ground or did they grow it in a lab? Like what was it, right? What was this stuff that you had? It's not just kale. You know what I mean? And so it's like, oh, well, I, I just stopped by and got a salad at the salad bar. Oh, did you have dressing on the salad? Well, yeah, a little bit. Well, what was the dressing? Oh, genetically modified canola oil. Like, okay. Now I'm not saying that's you, but I'm just saying it's really easy to be like, oh, it was the broccoli. It's like, really? Is the broccoli? Yeah. You know, it'd be uh, interesting to see what it really was. Or, you know, is it the glyphosate or is it the, you know, is it the radioactive Fukushima dust that got on the truck while it was driving down the highway? It's like, who just, I, I, I'm suspect of it being the plants. Um, I've really come to this place where I think that, um, and this is something I think we've probably brought up on the show before, but it's like, I really think we should look at the environment as being made up of all of these interlocking kingdoms of life. And we should consider eating from those different kingdoms. And so when we look at um, those kingdoms, we go, okay, there's animalia and there's plantae or plants, right? So there's animals, there's plants, there's kingdom fungi, all the mushrooms and yeasts. There's um, the protists that include the macro algaes. There's bacterial kingdoms where we get all of those probiotics. And you know something that's really become interesting to me with this recent pandemic happening is that um, this idea of a virome and that there's a human virome, your personal virome, and then there's the human shared virome. So for instance, <clears throat> this new coronavirus has, is a new addition to the collective human virome. We've not been exposed to it. It's novel. Uh, whereas many other viruses, like let's say the influenza viruses, they've been in our virome for a period of time. So we're also consuming viruses and they're getting into us too. We want actually, you know, I recently had a guy on my show. It was interesting because I wanted to talk about viruses. I didn't realize that this guy was going to be connected to, it's a small world in virology, obviously. I asked him a couple of questions that he gave me answers to that were like, oh man, you're on the payroll, bro. Oh like, shit. Oh yeah. It was really embarrassing. I, I didn't realize like, I, I, I thought he would give me an honest opinion of how, you know, things were being run by the WHO and, and Fauci and all those folks. And I mean, it was like, might as well have been Fauci himself who I had on the show. But anyway, <laughs> but, the, but, but most of the show is really, really incredible uh, because he was just talking. I mean, the guy was passionate about uh, viruses. And one of the questions I asked, are viruses ever um, beneficial the way we used to think all bacteria are bad? We didn't know bacteria existed. Then we discovered bacteria, realized that some infections were caused by them, and then went to war with bacteria. Until finally, we started to go like, oh, wait a second, some of these are good for us. Uh, oh my God, how do we, how have we survived this whole time here? <laughs> so similarly, we're thinking right now of viruses as negative, 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 but it turns out that without viruses around, probably life on earth would end. Viruses are crucial to many, many things. So we have viruses functioning in us that we don't even know fully what they do but uh, we're learning that they're also symbiotic. So my point is, we want to be consuming from all these kingdoms. You want to be, in my opinion, eating animals in a variety of animals. 
some that fly, some that walk, some that swim, some that slither. You know, we want to be eating their organs and their eggs and their skins and all of these associated parts, their bones as broth, all of that. We want to be eating plants. And that includes root structures and aerial parts, leaves, fruits, seeds, right? All of these, the oils that are in those plants, all of that. Fungi. We want to obviously be eating mushrooms. A lot of people have a lot of fungi in the form of yeasts and beverages that they consume, um, which can be nutritious. But we also want to be getting that myco, those micronutrients, which is why the medicinal mushrooms are so valuable to our immune systems and things like that. Uh, we want to be consuming bacteria in the form of foods that are fermented or foods that just have naturally occurring bacteria on them. Right? We want to be getting those viruses. We want to be getting algaes like seaweeds and things like that. So I personally think we should take a kingdomist approach, looking at all the kingdoms of life and making sure, rather than just like this four food groups thing we grew up with was like so simplistic and it, and, and it wasn't ecologically based. But I think like an ecologically based one where you go like, okay, let's eat from these six kingdoms of life and make sure that we're balancing our diet amongst those kingdoms. And so what we're seeing right now is the diet wars play out between you know, these different kingdomists right? Like one group is like, no, you can never eat from the animal kingdom. And the other group's like, you should never eat anything but the animal kingdom. And you know, all this kind of like goofy stuff when it's like, I imagine sort of our hunter-gatherer ancestors just like looking down like, oh man, these guys have gone up the deep end, you know? <laughs> like eat anything, bro, that you can, you know? So anyway, I think we need that diversity and that's what's really lacking. And so you know, when, you, when you're looking at it from that big picture perspective, and as we talked about before, you zoom into the supermarket level, you're like, ooh, it's not a lot in here. It's mostly wheat. Most of the supermarkets just wheat, corn, rice, turned into a thousand boxed products, like a thousand food products, right? Turned I, into different shapes and stuff. I remember a documentary, I think it's called King Corn or the King of Corn. <laughs> Go. It was yeah. Blew my mind. They go through the grocery store and they're just like corn, 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 corn. Like you know, ninety percent or something yeah. of every single thing in there's just made from corn. It's like wait, all we eat is corn. Weird. Yeah, uh, and if you drive through the Midwest when the corn's grown, you know, it's not like everybody. That's not like all that's destined for the grill where everyone's going to eat it as corn on the cob. Most of it's not edible anymore. It's a varieties of corn that have been bred to be disassembled into all the parts that go into food processing. And to become high fructose corn syrup or corn solids or you know corn starches or all these different things, right? It's not even an edible form of corn. That idea, I don't know if it was in that film they were talking about, like, hey, these farmers couldn't live on their own crop. It's not edible. Wow. It's made for industrial processing. You know? In reference to uh, coming to stay with you for a bit and eating the wild foods, dude, every time I watch your show, which by the way, has an amazing uh, web series, really high quality web series called Wild Fed, that follows Daniel's uh, adventures out, you know, in the natural habitat, hunting, foraging, fishing, etc. But at the end of those episodes, uh, typically they'll culminate with this really like foodie, high level cuisine made from those foods. And I'm not a foodie at all, but at the end of everyone, I'm like, oh God, I want to taste that. Because you get to see the adventure and the exploration within yeah. the natural environment that went into pulling all of those ingredients together. And I just, I, I love that. And every time I'm like, oh man, I got to get out to Maine. I want to taste that. Because they're <laughs> really weird stuff that people, you know, that, that now nowadays don't commonly eat. But it's also just prepared in a way that makes it look so delicious. I mean, it's like true cuisine. Yeah, it's, it's not... Um, people need to understand that our hunting and gathering ancestors were not starving. They weren't struggling to like scratch meals out of the environment. Like the food is incredible. And obviously they were well fed or we wouldn't be here. We're not the product of starving people right? We're the, the product of nourished folks. This week, we're eating a plant. Um, we're eating the flowers of the black locust tree. And the black locust tree is a invasive up here, a leguminous tree. It produces a, a bean pod as a fruit. But prior to fruiting, of course, it flowers. And right now, these, these trees will be you know, 60, 70 feet tall. And they'll be just covered in these drooping um, white and yellow flowers that smell like a mix between like oriental lily and jasmine. Um, and you'll smell it driving down the road. 
Like I always smell it before I see it. It's just this incredible perfume. But when you take the flowers and you strip them off the stem and you eat them, they taste like fresh peas. They don't, there's a little bit of that floral hint, but they don't, they're not all like perfumey or something. They taste like peas. Uh, they're beautiful and they'll become the base of our salads this week. And so it, you use it like you'd use lettuce, except your salad's made of the flour. And then that's gone in two weeks. You can't do it again. It's over until you got to wait a year, right? So that's that diversity. So earlier when I said I probably eat more foods this year already than the average person eats me, I'm not trying to brag or something. It's just that, you know, we had a salad the other day that was, that was the base. And I had cattail shoots in there. Most people never had cattail shoots. I had balsam greens in there. Most people never had that. I had pine greens in there. Most people never had that. Wild strawberries, very few people ever try them. You know, you start to just assemble a salad and you're like, okay, I got like six novel foods right in this salad that most people have never put in their mouth in our generation. And so what's really fascinating too um, is the emerging science that shows that the genetics of those plants that you eat actually impact your epigenome. So your gene expression is influenced by the plants you eat pretty significantly very significantly. And if you're, it's like, it's kind of like if you imagine that the genes that you eat are like information, right? That your epigenome uses to determine what genes you turn on and off. So it's like education. So when you eat foods from the environment, it's like you're educating your epigenome. Well, similarly, it's like the way most people's diets are would be like if you only read first grade books your whole life. And you never graduated to second grade reading and third grade reading and fourth grade until now where you're like able to comprehend complex information. Most people's diets is made out of like first grade, second grade level reading foods, right? Like foods that have very little genetic diversity and information in them. Whereas when you start to eat things out of the environment, it's like you're getting all this information and it shapes you into a different type of person. And uh, that's more true with plants than with animals. And I think it's probably even more significantly true with mushrooms. So, um, you know, I haven't seen specific research on that, but the impact of mushrooms on your body, the impacts of marine macro algaes, these lichens, like I was talking about before, these very strange foods that we don't think about. Um, you know, we've just gotten to, yeah, it's like, it's like celebrate diversity in your diet. You know, that'd be a, I'd like to see more of that for people because I'm actually really concerned about our species, man. Uh, I don't feel like there's any kind of real conversation taking place about what we've done to ourselves. There's more conversation about what we've done to pugs and German shepherds genetically than about what we're doing to ourselves. And that I think is a mistake because where do we want this to go? Do we want it to be like on an Elon Musk ship? in Mars where we're reproducing in Petri dishes because we're, we're sterile and we can no longer reproduce. And, you know, our lifespan is like diminishing and we are um, becoming stupider. I mean, is that, that's kind of like what, that's the, the path that we're on. And there's really no discussion about it. And it's, there's almost like an assumption that we all got on board somewhere. Cause I'm always like, where did I sign up for this? I didn't sign up for this. Like, I didn't agree to any of this. Like, wait, we're going to Mars? I didn't, I never signed up for that. Like, who made, who decided that? Um, we aren't being really honest about what we're doing. So there's almost like this, um, it's almost like if, if we can go fast enough, we can beat what's chasing us. Like, if we can get to Mars fast enough, we can get there before we genetically degrade into, you know, blobs on the floor. And before our ecosystem completely breaks down. So rather than like stop and face what we've created and deal with it and fix the problems, we're just going to run to the next place. You know, that just, I think, is such a huge mistake in thinking. And I've used the analogy before about relationships because it's what we, we, so many of us have done over the course of our lives by running from relationship to relationship. It's like not facing the problem. Or you see this in the recovery world where people, it's like, well, I'll just switch to a different drug okay, I'll switch to a different drug. It's like, well, you're not really addressing the issue, you know? And I feel like we need to address the issue. And the issue is like, we need to get our bodies right with the environment. It's not just about like reducing our carbon emissions. That's a symptom of the problem. <laughs> the problem is that our bodies are no longer a reflection of the ecosystem. The average person's body is made up of water that came from they don't know where, right? Their blood's all some plastic bottled water from who knows where. Their cells are nourished by foods from halfway around the world that were grown in super poor conditions. You know, we know that breast milk is filled with something like 50 industrial pollutants. Like we're, we need to deal with this stuff. 
because I, I don't think that we, um, we understand when we raise animals that if we don't take care of their genetic health by making sure that we are not letting them breed themselves into um, total submission, like, you know, like it's understood like with chickens that you need to bring in more diverse genes from time to time to keep the flock healthy. We're not thinking about these kind of things right now. We're doing serious damage to ourselves environmentally and with pollution. Um, we're, we're not asking the right questions. I mean, I, I look at what's, I'm frustrated with the, the discussion that's taking place because it's a, it's, it's a fractured discussion. It doesn't have all the details that need to be addressed. Hot damn. I'm, the, off the, I'm off the deep end right now. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great end to be deep into uh, because I'm all about root cause uh, versus, um, you know, um, a symptom relief. And the interesting thing about that approach to the diversity and getting back to our roots and thinking about the way that you eat and the, these meals that I see you eat on your show is that you're not eating that way because you're rich. <laughs> like You're eating that way because you educated yourself on what shit you can go out and eat and you spend your time and energy going out and getting it instead of slaving away at a corporate job or whatever one might do to try to get the money that they believe is going to lead them to access to life-sustaining foods. It, that's what's so funny yeah. about it. It's like the shit you're eating is actually free. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. like, and I get a lot of flack from people about my privileges of getting to do that and how it's a privilege, you know? And I think about that a lot. Like, uh, it's fascinating because it's, it's biologically normal to do, you know? So it's sort of strange to, to hear that. But I, I understand where people are coming from. But at the same time, uh, for those of us living in the United States, I mean, you don't have to be wealthy to do this and you don't have to have land. I mean, you have access to public land an incredible network of public land that every single person who lives here has access to, you know, particularly like with this hunt, you know, I mean, I know that most people are never going to do this. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to go down this selling this hunting and gathering idea to people. I think it's pretty obscure. I think it's important that people like me keep it alive and keep a connection to that. I think that's really, really important. Um, but I mean, people don't realize what they have access to here. Like, you know, you're a public landowner, man. You own a lot of land. You know, who owns Yellowstone? You do. <laughs> you do. You're actually the owner of that. And so am I. Like you own collectively all the game in California. Like you are, you, you own a share of all the wild animals. Like I'm, I'm saying legally, like actually legally on the books, you do. So sometimes people are like, oh, it's a privilege. You have the ability to access that. It's like, well, I mean, I've kind of spent the last couple of decades learning how and really like positioning myself to do it. I guess it's a privilege, but like it's also what my ancestors did. Was it a privilege then or is it just a privilege? It, you know, it gets like kind of complicated, but to me, it's just like, man, somebody needs to do this. I think, you know, I think it's important. People seem to think it's important that people run around on a field and catch balls. You know, people seem to think that it's important to like go round and round a circle in cars. Like, I think it's important that maybe we keep alive the food tradition that stretches back. 1.6 million years, like maybe somebody wants to keep that alive too. I don't know if we're going to catch balls and drive <laughs> cars in circles, you know? <laughs> so, so it's like gro grown men in, in pink shirts, like hitting balls into holes in the ground with a, you know, and driving around in little mini cars. Like, what is this? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what is this pursuit? <laughs> oh man. It's, you know, it's recreation, right? Recreation. Yeah, recreation. Of, uh, That's it. Yeah. Of the of the games that would have been played living uh, on the land, yeah, would have been yeah, so so many sports and everything are that yeah. yeah. It's fulfilling. I think fulfilling that instinct to be active in that way. You know, we have those instinctive drives to chase shit and be chased and win and you know have a goal and a target and achieve it. And it's never been something I personally have been uh, you know uh, in any way attracted to per se, but. Um, the last thing that I wanted to get into here was just a couple of specifics, you know, and as we indicated earlier in the conversation, you are just, you know, kind of just not naturally a shill for the product. <laughs> for my own company. <laughs> shill for your own company. Um, but a couple of things that you guys do, I've been really into for many years and continue to be. And um, just in general, I think... For those of us that don't have the opportunity to go out and 
you know, be a hunter gatherer uh, and we're still getting our food from the farmer's market or the grocery store, uh, there are ways that we can supplementally get some really potent, nutritious, in, um, uh, you know, compounds into our body. And so one of them I wanted to touch on, which I think many people are becoming aware of, but it's still relatively obscure. And that is the supplemental form of vitamin D3, which I think most people are somewhat unaware that it's, um, it's not so much a, a vitamin, but more of a hormone. And also its relationship to K2. And those seem to be things that uh, are difficult to get from a diet. And if you live somewhere where there's not tons of sun, difficult to get from the environment. So let's just start with that one. And maybe we can just do kind of short breakdowns of a few of these things that I want to cover. Vitamin D3 is really fascinating. And the reason we're talking about D3 is because vitamin D2 is not the bioactive form. And so D2 is used in a lot of supplementation, but it's a really poor substitute for the actual thing, vitamin D3, the hormone form. Um, your body has to you know, transform vitamin D2 into vitamin D3. Um, and it does that uh, through UV light, right? So as you brought up before, when and this, you know, if you look at milk products in the country, it's interesting how we fortify them with vitamin D, and that's because vitamin D was being poorly represented in the diet. Uh, and and as I understand it, the cities had become like artificial canyons, and the children that were playing in the city streets were not getting sunlight in the same way. It's like if you've ever been in the Grand Canyon, you know, uh, another place you own. Uh, if you've ever been in the Grand Canyon, you know, the sun <laughs> kind of goes over that little window at the top, and then it's gone, right? So you have light in there, but you don't have that direct sunlight on your skin as much as you should. So the cities can be like that. So you know, less so in places like LA, which are more spread out, but more so in places like New York. And so what happens in children who have a vitamin D deficiency is they develop rickets. So their bones can't ostify properly. They don't get enough calcium laid down in the bone. And what happens in adults is called osteomalacia, which just means like bone pain a lot of people are living with because there's like a silent epidemic of vitamin D3 deficiency right now. So a lot of people have chronic pain. I mean, it's like you start drilling in on people. It's like chronic pain is very, very common. And for some people, that's because of a lack of vitamin D. And one of the reasons is because the places where like vitamin D, your body where you store it is in your liver. So most people aren't eating very much liver anymore. And that's one of the places that you'd get it. Another place that you get a lot of vitamin D3 would be um, from like, you know, deep sea fishes, the livers of those animals. Or, um, you know, this is an interesting fact with polar bears. You have to be extremely limited in the amount of polar bear liver you eat because there's so much vitamin D3 that you can actually, it's toxic, the quantity, right? Because D3 is an oil soluble vitamin, so you don't excrete it. Like vitamin C, you can overdose and you pee it out or if people who've taken large doses know it'll come out the other way too, it just flushes out of you. But fat-soluble vitamins store up, so you have to be kind of careful, right? But th those things aren't in people's that Most people don't eat polar bear liver anymore or cod liver anymore or you know that's less common. So we're not seeing as much vitamin D in people's diets anymore. And then despite what people think, they're not getting as much sun exposure as they should be. And the darker your skin is, the more important this is. So for instance, here in Maine, um, we have a significant population of folks from Somalia, let's say. So um, they're living here in Maine and the, we don't have enough sun here for them to actually, they have with all that melanin in their skin, they kick out a lot of UV light because they come from a place with massive amounts of sun. So their bodies have adapted over the course of time to extreme amounts of sun with basically what's a built-in sunblock. You know, you sort of think about that beautiful melanin rich skin that some people have. It's like that's a sunblock. And the reason that people who have much paler skin are paler is because they come from a place where there was less sun. So anytime there was any sun, you needed skin that would let it right through. So white people's skin is like a window that lets vitamin D in because they come from places where it's often cloudy. Like think of Northern Europe, very little sunlight, long winters, not enough sun. So you have to have kind of clear skin to let that in. But then if you think about if you were in Africa, where you have reliable sun just about every single day, places that were like a really nice day is a cloudy day because it's something different, right? It's a reprieve from the sun. It's like, oh, wow, we're having a really beautiful day today because it's cloudy. So you need skin that can kick out a lot of that, right? So here's what happens. People who have 
really light skin move to a place because now we're global. So if somebody with really light skin moves to a place where there's lots of sun, they get skin cancer. But somebody with really dark skin goes to a place like Maine where we don't have a lot of sunlight and they actually develop a, a subtly and over time develop a vitamin D deficiency. So this is becoming kind of a problem. The other thing is people are always wearing clothes. People are now always wearing sunblock. They're not getting enough vitamin D3 in their diet and they're not producing enough. So you need it in your life. And it's the thing is, is that vitamin D is, is protective against something like 70 plus cancers. That's pretty significant, you know, including like colorectal cancers. Um, so that's like a really big issue. And then the other thing is the ability to lay down calcium on the bones. Now, without K2, the problem is if you lack K2, the calcium doesn't get to where it needs to go. And you don't want calcium just sort of randomly in your body because that's what arterial plaque is. So when people are having like a buildup of arterial plaque, they have a heart attack or a stroke, the calcium is implicated in that. Calcium that should be in your bones. Uh, so you know you need K2 to make that happen. So yeah, we produce a vitamin D3 K2. It's very inexpensive too. I think it's $29 a bottle, but it's like a, you know several months supply because the dose is two drops a day. Because vitamin D is a thing you don't want to... It's not like oh, the more the better. It's that you, you, know, it, you have to limit your intake of it. Um, but we get our vitamin D3 from lanolin, so from the wool of sheep. And we get the K2 from natto, that Japanese... There's another one. It's like K2 is really important in the diet, but most people aren't digging on natto these days. You ever eat that? I like natto. You're uh, the weirdest guy. Good luck <laughs> living with a partner who will allow you to open the canister while they're in the house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and just looking at it too, it's got that like snot saliva look to it. So anyway, our, our vitamin D3 K2 is coming from sheep and coming from, um, from natto. Uh, but anyway, the combination of the two gets you. And the other thing I think where it's really relevant is because there is, you know, I believe there is a respiratory disease going around. I don't think it's nearly as prevalent or um, warranted some of the the, rea- the response we've had to it. But I do think that is going around. And um, as is flu, which is always going around, which we've, we've become pretty adapted to and we're familiar with. But, um, you know, our ability to fight off respiratory diseases and vitamin D3 are very interlinked. So I just think, you know, everybody should have a D3. And the other thing is, is I think right now it would be as smart to um, get grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles and mom and dad on vitamin D3 as it is to avoid them altogether. I mean, I think it's, you know, everybody needs to kind of decide where they are on those things, but um, but high risk individuals should should be on a vitamin D, particularly if they have limited sun exposure. Uh, um, you know, but in addition to that, I mean, you know, it's important that we get good sun. That is important. And the darker your skin is, going back to what I said before, if you come from African descent, or well, you know, if you're a, a brown skinned person, you need way more vitamin. You need way more sun to produce vitamin D than somebody who say you know red haired and freckled. There, that person needs very little. Like you know, twelve minutes of sun on their forearms is probably enough for them to get their vitamin D three needs. Whereas if you have very dark skin, you might need a couple of hours of good solid sun exposure on a, a much more significant part of your body. So everybody needs to determine that, and then that kind of ties into what we were saying before. Because if you don't have that phytoprotective, you know, qualities that you get from colored pigments and fruits and berries and things like that, sun can be pretty hard on your body. So it's comprehensive. I don't mean like vitamin D3 is like the you know panacea for everything, but if it's missing in your diet, boy, that's a, that's a problem. Well, that brings me to the next, uh, the uh, you know, common supplement or one of the pillars of, of the Chinese herbal system, and that is the chaga mushroom. Yeah. And I, I wonder if you could explain some of its benefits, but also the piece of the, the, I think it has D2 in it, the element that makes it kind of an internal sunscreen. Are oh, you- it's interesting. With, with a lot of mushroom fruit bodies, and, but, and just to clear, chaga is more known in the um, Russian um, system of, oh. you know, of traditional medicine and stuff, but... It was being more in the, in the um, Chinese system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But... Um, Mushroom. I don't. I don't know if this is true of chaga, actually. So let me just say this about other fruit bodies, like, um, like reishi. If you take reishi mushrooms and you put them out to dry in the sun, uh, they produce vitamin D two. Now, again, before I said like vitamin D two is not as effective as vitamin D three, but you'll convert some of it over into vitamin D three. So that UV response, just like in our skin, you know, we get into our oils, we get this 
this vitamin that is converted to the, to the vitamin D that we need by UV. That happens with mushrooms too. So sun. So for anybody who harvests their own mushrooms, if you can dry them in the sun. Now, normally I would avoid drying things in the sun because sunlight tends to break things down, breaks nutrients down. But with mushrooms, you actually end up with this more vitamin D. So that's really interesting. But uh, medicinal mushrooms, man, the, the biggest thing for me is that they modulate your immune system. And this is just on some other level to me. This is like some sci-fi stuff because if you just took an immunostimulant, right, that would make your immune system kind of picture um, an aggressive force, like let's say a military force. Um, depending on the mission, you don't always want them cranked up and ready to do battle. Like sometimes they have a peacekeeping role where they need to be chilled way down, but sometimes they need to be really aggressive about what they're doing. It depends on the mission, right? So if you were immuno, if you were immuno deficient, let's say that you had, um, you know, a, a significant immunodeficiency, your immune system's weak. It's like the troops are in that peacekeeping mission when they should be in a more aggressive war footing. Conversely, if you're autoimmune, it's like your immune system's on such a war footing that in the absence of an enemy, it attacks your own tissue. That's also a huge problem, right? That's what we see in things like lupus, where we see this autoimmune response. So the really cool thing about medicinal mushrooms, and they do a lot of different things. I mean, you could do multiple three-hour shows just talking about what they do, but the, probably the most interesting thing to me is immunomodulation, which is takes that strong immune system and, and brings it down, takes that weak immune system and brings it up. So what's cool about that is, you know, you don't have to worry like, oh, is this going to overstimulate my immune system? It's not. If you're, it, it somehow intelligently knows where your immune system needs to be. I think of it as an education for a, your immune system. So if you want, you don't want to just, it's not like you don't want like coffee to the immune system all the time. Sometimes that that's going to be really dangerous to some people. But what's cool about medicinal mushrooms is they'll help to tune that for you. They're also really protective against cancers. And boy, you know, it's, it's difficult to, there's a lot of reasons I think for why we have such a prevalence of cancers today. Part of it's that we live longer. So we have more time for cancers to develop. But really, I think, you know, what are we introducing 70,000 new chemicals into the environment? You know, that, that kind of thing is a huge problem. Um, you know, be all these environmental pollutants. Um, something that I found really interesting is the idea that there, there may be uh, viruses that have contaminated our blood supply and vaccines that uh, might be cancer causing viruses. So that's like a potential to, you know, we have all these different things that are causing cancers. We really need things that can protect us against that. Uh, and so medicinal mushrooms are just this incredible ally for that. So, you know, they have all kinds of really, really cool uses. And those are just some of them. But I just think, as I said before, you want to have foods from all of the different kingdoms in your life. And if you don't, and I'm not talking about white button mushrooms, right? That's, that is the, the white button mushroom or the portobello. Those are the, those are the iceberg lettuce of the mushroom world, right? These are not what I'm talking about. You need real strong, powerful, potent medicinal mushrooms in your life. Um, and just incidentally, the way we make them is, um, and this is really important when you choose a mushroom product, if you're going to use one as a supplement, is that you want these two extracted portions of a mushroom. You, there's one fraction that comes out in alcohol because of reishi mushrooms, you've seen them, they're not a food. They're not like a, you know, it's like a woody hard structure. Yeah. Yeah. So you want the alcohol fraction, the part that comes out in alcohol, and you want the part that comes out by boiling in hot water. And I think also what's really important, all of the survival medicinal mushrooms, we make them with fruit bodies. We are not using, you know, Chinese mycelial mass that's coming out of, you know, grown on corn or wheat or whatever it is, barley that they're growing it on. We use wood grown fruit bodies. So, our, and our chog is all wild actually, right from here in Maine, which is really cool. Um, so, you know, we have foragers who actually gather that for us, but, but we're using the real mushroom. All of the, re most of the mushroom products that are out there right now are mycelial products, but all the research on medicinal mushrooms is done on fruit bodies, not on mycelia. So a lot of people like to say, oh, our mushrooms do this and they do that. And it's like, well, that's not what the research, we don't know, maybe they do, but that's not been researched. You know, what's been researched are the fruit bodies. So you want wood grown fruit bodies that are extracted in alcohol and hot water and mixed together because that water portion is where you get that immunomodulation I talked about before. But what's really cool too is that out of the alcohol portion, you get all these terpenes, which are super good uh, adaptogens. 
And I just think like that is so important right now because our environment is rapidly changing. Like I live in the Gulf of Maine where we have the fastest warming waters in the world. It's changing so fast that our lobsters are moving north a couple of kilometers a year. And all these fish that have never been here before are coming up from the south. Like it's completely turning over. It's causing chaos in our fisheries. You know, we have tog and black sea bass coming up. They weren't here before. And our lobsters are headed to Canada. Things are changing. This environment is changing. And most of us can recognize that. Um, mushrooms help you adapt to changes in your environment. They help you adapt to physiological, emotional, psychological stresses. Um, Reishi, as you know, has got this long history for meditators were using it. Why? Because it creates sort of this plasticity in your mind, allowing you to sort of adapt better to the stresses that you're under. So when I look at overall the impacts of domestication and then how rapidly our environment's changing, you want adaptogens in your diet. It's just really, really important. Yeah. As someone who has never, for some reason, enjoyed the taste of culinary mushrooms, and you might be able really, to... Huh? You got some food stuff, huh? <laughs> Troll issues. Um, no, <laughs> there's two foods that I just like almost almost make me gag the flavor. One is eggs, like cooked eggs of any type. And <laughs> it's like cooked culinary mushrooms. It's just weird. But anyway, I do eat egg yolks and I eat tons of mushrooms. But I, it's like ever since I found out about chaga, reishi, lion's mane, cordyceps, it's just like my body just gives me such a huge green light when I put them in my mouth. Like just yeah. there's this relationship I have with fungi. I just don't particularly like the taste. And even in the realm of psilocybin of macro or micro, micro dosing. Oh um, yeah, that's gnarly, right? Everything in my being just like ding, ding, ding. Yes, there are friends. Like they, yeah. mushrooms to me, they- But they, when, I was, when I was a kid and I remember like, you know, when I first tried mushrooms like that, where I'd be like, oh, just eat these. And you're like, out of a, like a baggie. Oh, it's so gross, you know? And then you're like, you're just going to puke. Um, I, I noticed with our reishi product, it, the flavor is really intensely bitter. But in this way where, like you said, you kind of like... And I have never tried to doctor up the flavor of it because it's bitter. It's like, I, I, there's nothing I'm going to add to it that's going to like... To me, like trying to cover bitter with sweets is even weirder. Uh, but chaga that you brought up before, what's so fascinating about it is that it tastes so good and it does not have any mushroomy flavor. It's not really a mushroom, it's a sclerotium. So it's it's a fungal storage organ. Um, it's this big black mass that grows on birch trees, but the flavor is like vanilla um, and it's very mild. And so our chaga product compared against our reishi, both are really potent, but the chaga formula, we have a little vanilla in um, and we have a little maple syrup in it and it kind of ties together this, I mean, it's a very desserty flavor. So for people who are like sensitive to that mushroom taste in the reishi, you're going to go like, oh, that's probably a mushroom. In the chaga, you're like, that's candy. What is that? It's so good, you know? Problem with your chaga is that it's hard for me to make it last. <laughs> no, I know. I know. <laughs> more like okay cool a little d d will do you because you feel the medicine in it but it's yeah. with the with the chaga um not so much because it is it's so good i know i've thought a lot about doing it in like one liter bottles but i think that requires different licensing <laughs> yeah I keep too much <laughs> yeah that's funny i remember dude when i first started using your mushroom products this is i mean god i guess it must have been yeah going back 10 years or something and i was i was so uh prudent about my contact with alcohol I don't know if... Oh, right. I think, I, weren't we cooking it off? Before I even met you, I think I emailed I the site. I really, you know, I'm really resonating with the medicinal mushrooms, but your tinctures have alcohol because as you indicated, to get the medicine out, or at least, you know, part of that medicine, you have to use alcohol and that grain alcohol is still left in the tincture. And I was so paranoid. I, I mean, wisely so considering my history that... Uh, what I used to do is I would I would take uh, the bottle and put it in a pot of water on the stove and like boil off the alcohol, evaporate the alcohol, and be left yeah. alcohol less tincture. Now I you know it hasn't been a problem after um, you know many years of taking as much of it. But that's a really cool point that you bring up because alcohol boils off at a lower temperature than water. That if somebody has that issue, they can cook the alcohol off before you damage the the product itself because the water content will still you know be there. Uh, protecting the product from getting too hot. Yeah. I mean, I still got the benefit from it. And it, it was just, I ended up just realizing that I was safe and it wasn't going to trigger any kind of 
you know, craving or anything. And it was- I have seen it though. I have seen a person relapse into a very significant um, alcohol problem by starting off with tinctures. Yeah, I I know one person who did that. Word to the wise. Uh, What about, you know, something I haven't asked you about and that is the, does it not like- um, vasodilate under your tongue when you put a tincture that has alcohol, does that not also assist in the absorption of it? Or am I imagining? Certain things it does. Oh, okay. Certain things it does, but it depends on the size of the molecule. But certain things will, will absorb through the buccal membranes along with the alcohol. But I don't, know, I, I don't know about the big complex carbohydrates that are the valuable portion of medicinal mushrooms. I doubt that. I think oh, they, okay. probably need, they probably end up being absorbed in the digestive tract because the, the beta glucans, or sometimes we'll hear them called polysaccharides. A polysaccharide just means many carbohydrates, a big complex carbohydrate, not like the kind that's in potatoes and bread, um, but these medicinal sugars that are not sweet. Um, those are the, some of the active components in the immune side. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if some of the terpenes are absorbed in the mouth. I, I'm, I'm speculating, uh, but I don't think that those carbohydrates are. I think it's probably a digestive tract thing. Uh, okay. Maybe it just feels like it because it has that little stinging sensation. I'm like, oh, yeah. There. Well, like with our antler products, like some of those molecules do get uptaken. Uh, some of those growth factors get uptaken in the mouth. So in some cases that is true. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, where alcohol becomes like a carrier uh, into the bloodstream. Right. Like, you know, I, I noticed even um, the uh, cacao will have that effect also. It, it works as a good carrier. It's like a different experience. For example, if you going back to psilocybin, if you eat some psilocybin mushrooms and just gnarl through them and chew them up, you're going to have a little bit of a weight. But if they're in some chocolate truffles, like in 15 minutes, you're like, okay, here we go. It's just, it's That's weird. True. You yeah. Know? Like a potentiator, they call that. I like the alchemy of different things like that. And on, on the chaga piece, and then I want to get into just a couple more there. Um, you know, one thing I really love to do is I'll go on eBay and I'll order very carefully. I mean, I have a couple sellers that I'll buy, uh, you know, like five pound bags of chaga. And it often is from Maine, actually, uh, that's been wild harvested and then sun dried. And um, I would make these big batches of it in my, uh, in my crock pot. And then I would put it in the refrigerator in a jug and use it for the base of my coffee because it has that nice vanilla flavor. It goes perfectly in that flavor. And, um, and also, it, it's, it's, it seems to be very alkaline. It seems to cut the acidity of my coffee, mm-hmm. especially if I put some shilajit or something really acidic in there, which I often do. Uh, but then I realized I'm not getting the alcohol extraction. So I'm kind of like, yeah. in a sense... It's still really good for you, man. I, I also, you know, in addition, like, I mean... It's like I have it right here. I take I take this all the time, right? So um, I take my own product, but um, I make. I, I'll be honest, my wife um, boils it for me. Avani's really good to me like that. So it's like we have little things we do for each other. And one of those that she for, does for me is she boils my chaga because every morning when I get up, it goes in my smoothie right. as the, instead of water, right? And it's always a bummer. Like if I run out of it, it's like oh, water. I like to put chaga as the base of my smoothie. So. Um, I use it really, really regularly. You're still getting those immuno benefits. And the interesting thing about chaga is it needs to be boiled for like two hours before you start to extract the stuff that you're trying to extract. But you know, I'll make real concentrated batches of it and leave it in the refrigerator. But I still take my own product because it has the terpene extract as well. So those adaptogens um, that I want, those things that help you better utilize oxygen, for example, and things like that, that kind of stuff is, is in that alcohol fraction. Got it. And actually, just back to what you said about the uptake with the alcohol, another example would be, you know, in our pine pollen product where there's testosterone in that. If you think about testosterone, that's a small enough molecule that it's usually given to people transdermally. So you never really see like, oh, rub this reishi on your skin. Like it's not going to be absorbed that way. Hormones are absorbed that way. So typically you'll see them given as a transdermal. Uh, So obviously in alcohol, it's very easy to to get it to uptake directly into the bloodstream. So in some instances, the tincture is the delivery mechanism, but in other instances, the alcohol is just the extraction medium. Okay, cool. That brings me to the next thing I wanted to talk about, and that is uh, pine pollen. This... What a thing that is, huh? (laughs) That stuff is just so I, interesting. I've been talking about well yours in particular because I've tried different you know like I don't know different brands over the years. People would gift me or something. I don't want to be disparaging toward other brands, but some of it I'm just like I don't know. This doesn't do anything. But specifically the liquid tincture that you guys have, and um, I've recommended it to so many guys for you know libido and just 
that testosterone, yeah. like I, it's like an aphrodisiac kind of thing. And I don't really ever believe in that kind of stuff for some reason. I'm like, I, I just don't think it's going to work in that capacity. But um, I've had so many skeptical friends because I'm, you know, I'm almost 50. Most of my friends are a few years younger, but they're like, man, hey, uh, Luke, you know anything for... Uh, <laughs> Like, dude, pine pollen on a yeah. or two, and you're gonna wake up with a pup tent in your bed. And <laughs> universally, mm-hmm. say 100% of the time, but more often than not, a, a friend's come back and be like, dude, you were right about that. It's crazy. Like, it really, it really does um, increase your libido. And it's just, it's true. We've had some pretty high profile folks in, in that town. Uh, on that product, you know, I can't say their names, of course, you know, but it's like there's been some pretty high profile people who are using it instead of hormone replacement. So it's super common now to see guys over 45 on testosterone replacement therapy. Um, and I think, you know, with hormone replacement therapy, it's like um, there's quite, it's quite a technology. I mean, you look at the benefits of it, and it's pretty incredible. But my question was like, well, if this issue of andropause, which is, you know, a word we don't hear much. We hear menopause a lot. We don't hear... Because with menopause, you have something that's so visually obvious, a change that's very obvious, right? It's like... A, um, it, it's a very objective. Whereas with andropause, which is when a man's body starts to reduce its production of hormones like testosterone and other androgens, you know, it's not something that's as obvious. So guys start to notice less of the pup tent. They start to notice less motivation because testosterone and motivation and especially goal oriented stuff is really tied. That's all tied together. Uh, So they start to not have that anymore. There starts to be like emotional flatness and it's from that reduction, you know, and people think back to how they used to feel. It's like, wow, I don't know what's happened to me. I used to feel so good. It's like, well, you had way more testosterone then. So um, what's just amazing to me is that pine trees in their pollen, which is the plant equivalent of sperm. So pollen is the male part of the reproductive cycle in plants, right? So that pollen gets into the flower, which is the ovum, which is the female part. So that's sort of how plants have sex. Um, So, you know, pollen is the sperm of plants and flowering plants and pine pollen's sperm or pollen, I'm sorry, pine sperm or pine pollen has testosterone in it. And it has also a whole bunch of other phytoandrogens. So these are other male hormones. So it's not just testosterone. It's actually a pretty complex and well-rounded suite of male hormones. Uh, you know, obviously there these are hormones in women too. Um, just like estrogen is in male bodies as well. But you know, we tend to think of it as more of a male hormone. Um, but also it has all these phytosterols, which are plant steroids. So all that stuff is in pine pollen because pine pollen is sprinkled out over the whole environment. And in that stuff gets into the soil microbes. It gets into, it gets onto other plants. It gets into animals. So pine trees, I just think of as like this benevolent entity. I mean, I'm like, I've got, you know, pine trees all all out here on the land. And we've just come through the season where everything is just covered in a yellow dust every morning when you wake up and they're just spraying this testosterone out on everything. So your ability to absorb that hormone is somewhat diminished with just the pollen. We sell the pollen as a powder, you know, but the, you know, we, and we sell just a pine pollen tincture, but the product I think is the most exciting is we call it P4. It's our pine pollen pure potency. So that product, man, there's something special there. The, that's pine pollen. It's also got stinging nettle root in it, uh, which I'll explain why in a second. And then we do it with a little orange peel. Um, that's got vanilla bean and it's got a little maple in it. And it's like, it's pretty delicious, right? It's like this, we call it the orange creamsicle. But the reason <clears throat> that you want the alcohol extract of the pine pollen there's hormones in the meats that we eat. There's hormones in our environment. And if they were easily absorbed, they would have impacts on us physiologically that maybe we don't want. So your body breaks hormones down in the digestive tract. That's why they don't usually give you a testosterone pill. They'll give you a cream and the same with female hormones. So you need a carrier into the blood. And so the alcohol becomes that carrier and it gets that testosterone into your body. So pine pollen will bring your testosterone levels up when used in an alcohol extract. 
Um, another thing that happens though is that people will have testosterone in their blood, but it's not available. It's not freely available. It's not what's called free testosterone. And then there's a sex hormone binding globulin. It's this thing that attaches to your testosterone and keeps it from being accessible by your body. I'm not sure why, um, but stinging nettle root, so the underground part of that plant, contains a molecule that will free that testosterone. It will bind to that sex hormone globulin and it'll free up the testosterone. So those two things together in that product that's pretty powerful. And then we put Siberian ginseng in there too, which works on the hypothalamus and, and helps to regulate your natural hormone production. So those three together become the powerhouse of that product we call um, Pine Palm Pure Potency. And we developed that, I developed that going like, hey, I'm going to need this one day. And I had learned from this herbalist, Stephen Harrod Buner, about pine pollen. And I thought, man, I need to like figure out how to make sure that I don't need to be on synthetic testosterone down the road. So developed that product. And um, what we recommend to, to people who want to use it for that is that you take it at times where you have natural testosterone spikes because your body three times a day um, cranks up the testosterone. So that's um, just before you wake up, uh, which is that pup tent you were talking about. So that's like first thing in the morning. Uh, right around noon, you have another spike. And then you have another spike after you go to sleep at like 2 a.m. So you want to take it at times where it will ele naturally elevate the already you know, high amplitude in your blood volume. So uh, you either take it first thing in the morning, take it at noon, or take it before bed, or you know, twice a day or three times a day, but it's at those three times. First thing in the morning, noon, before bed. So most people, I just have them keep it at the bed stand. And just take it, you know, you know, when they first wake up, when they go to bed, or both. Um, but you know, that's a really that's one of our best selling products because we have so many repeat customers where that's become the cornerstone of how they're sort of dealing with hormonal changes in their life. Well, there's two things. I mean, I've tried all your stuff over the years at various times, and I go through phases of like when I want what. But there's two things that I've always had in my house, and right now in the other room are there in abundance, and that is the the pure potency pine pollen one and also the colostrum. Those are just like... The colostrum's no, crazy, right? They're just non-negotiable. And um, I want to I cover colostrum and I feel like I'm like, we've been on this for a while. Thank you for your, your uh, you know, generosity of time. I'm just, as you know, I'm a very curious person and I won't stop until I feel like <laughs> I know everything this person knows now. Um, and hopefully our audience hangs in uh, and um, feel the same way. But with the... Oh, no, I know there's one thing I wanted to cover first. I think a lot of people, as you, as you indicated, that testosterone is present in both males and females, as is estrogen. But I, I think that women underestimate the value of having balanced and proper levels of testosterone because mm -hmm. it, is, it is perceived as such a male-centric Hormone, yeah, which is changing because this this was something that started to happen early in because I think we've probably been producing our pine pollen product for ten years now, and initially we thought it would be a product you know primarily purchased by men, and then when we started seeing women buy it, we assumed women were buying it for men, and then we started to find out, and I just it was ignorant about it. I didn't know that a lot of women are being prescribed testosterone now. So low testosterone problems are an issue in some women. So if that is you, then, then, you know, this is a product that could potentially be valuable to you. And my suggestion would be, you know, anytime you start messing with your hormones, probably good to have a baseline, use the product, figure out where it takes your blood levels and all that. And if you're working with a clinician, that's something, you know, I mean... I say that and then I, I'm not really the type who likes to go get blood tests all the time, but I say that just to sort of, you know, I think it's a delicate thing, you know, women starting to put heavy amounts of testosterone into their bloodstream, you know, without sort of knowing what they're trying to achieve. But if you've been diagnosed as a woman with low testosterone, this product could be really, really valuable for you and give you the ability to work with nature instead of working you know, with synthetic hormones, if that's something you're interested in. But yeah, it's becoming more common. And, you know, I think the other issue that a lot of people are dealing with is just a massive imbalance of estrogens because for whatever reason, I'm sure you've noticed this, Luke, it's like, it seems like so many toxins in our environment behave like estrogen in our body. None of them are behaving like testosterone in our body, which is kind of a bummer, right? So plastics, they function like xenoestrogens. A lot of plant compounds function as phytoestrogens. Now we're learning about metalloestrogens that heavy metals can function like estrogens in the body. So they bind to estrogen receptors and the body perceives them as estrogen. So we start to create this excessive amount of estrogen. So the androgen-estrogen balance gets thrown out of whack. 
kind it'd be like it'd be cool if it was like oh yeah well you know i used a ziploc bag and it just tracks like testosterone be like that'd be cool but it doesn't and so we're we're sort of in this sea of manufactured xenoestrogens um, I talked earlier at length about the problems with eating the same stuff over time because you can end up with too much est- or too much of, of a chemical of a phytochemical and, and phytoestrogens are an example of that. Um, so you know that's something we have to think about. So um, I think having a phytotestosterone is really valuable because it can help to restore some of that balance because we're not meant to be. Um, this skewed towards you know estrogens and i and i don't that's obviously not meant as estrogen is really really important it's just that there's a lot of you know estrogens around all right cool on the colostrum tip uh for people that have not heard about this particular uh, substance give us a breakdown of what it is because this is like i said just it's i eat a i don't know i eat what my body wants i mean i guess i eat more stuff than i indicated earlier i just I'm noticing that I'm potentially allergic to a few things, but I do eat more than just beef. Let's just get the record straight. Uh, <laughs> my morning elixir, you know, I never really read what the dosage is on stuff, and I don't recommend that to people. It's just, I don't know. I'm just that way. I just, what feels good. And so I've been putting, I have one of those huge kind of, it's not a ladle, it's a spoon, like a stainless steel spoon, a giant spoon that's, I don't know, maybe if you have a heaping, one of my heaping spoons is probably like 10 or I don't know, maybe 20 tables. <laughs> I don't even know, you know, but the colostrum, like the powder colostrum you guys make, it's kind of, it's a little sticky, you know? So if you put that spoon in there and take a big, it doesn't fall off like a flower. It's got full oils in it. That's why. Yeah, so it has these fats that kind of hold it together. So I'm just going in there and I go, eh, that looks about right. And and I'm throwing that in my morning coffee. And uh, one day my girlfriend, Allison, comes in. She's like, wow, you put a lot of that. So you don't really even know what it is. You know, she goes, wow, you put a lot of that. And I was like, yeah. She goes, well, what, you know, how much are you supposed to use? I said, I don't know. Who cares? Just feels good. Do it. And she looks on the the bottle. I get the big, I think it's, what is it? Five kilos? Is that the Darth Vader helmet, we call it? <laughs> ordering shit every week. So I'm just, I just stock up on stuff. I'm kind of a right. hoarder. And she looks on the thing and I think it said like one teaspoon is like a, or something. She's like, dude, what are you doing? But I don't know. I just like, I love the flavor of it. And I just, it's got this really soothing, um, mm-hmm. a really soothing effect on my gut. And my that, gut. Well, that's one of the principal. I, I tend to think of it as an immuno medicine because um, it really is. And as a food, but I mean, wow, its ability to restore the gut tract is pretty revolutionary. Uh, like for anybody with IBS or Crohn's or any other digestive problem, I, that especially leaking gut, anything that has to do with the lining of the digestive tract, mm-hmm. uh, you should look. The, one of the things that's really cool about colostrum, and I'll back up in a minute here and explain what it is, but um, it's got more scientific research behind it than most any supplement. I mean, I think at last count, it was over 4,000 studies on colostrum. And so um, it's been looked at very, very extensively. I mean, because we've had this stuff with us for 8,000 years. And so uh, we know a lot about it. Um, so what colostrum is, is the, the very first product that mammals receive from their mother. Um, so the first thing a mammal gets from its mother is not milk, but it's colostrum. And then milk fills in the mammary behind colostrum after the colostrum has been used up. So um, when a calf is born, so this colostrum is bovine, it comes from cows and cow colostrum uniquely works in people in a way that sheep and goat, you know, a lot of people will say, Hey, I do better on sheep milk or sheep cheese or goat cheese. Um, And for a lot of people, that's true. Uh, However, the colostrums from those animals work differently, but cow colostrum, because of um, the, the way that immunity is passed on to calves, it's, it's bovine colostrum is what you want. So the thing is, is that the udder initially fills with colostrum. And then as the calf drinks that colostrum, milk fills in behind it. Um, so what you want is the very first milking off of a cow after it calves. Now, a lot of people are like, well, if you do that, what about the calf? And that's like, well, the thing is, is that cows produce, they, they've been bred over the course of 8,000 years to overproduce. So a calf needs one to two liters of colostrum, but a cow produces many more liters than that. So you can't really restrict a calf from colostrum because it won't 
if it survives, it won't do well. It needs colostrum. So, you know, it's never come, it's never taken at the expense of the calf. You can't do that and have a productive dairy. But um, anyway, this product is how cows pass their immune system onto their infants. Uh, humans get colostrum from our mothers too, but we get most of our immune system through the umbilical cord. So we're not getting it all from the colostrum. And that's why the sheep and goat thing doesn't work as well because they're similar. But cows pass on the immune system through the colostrum. And it's kind of like this weird science on how it works because there's something in there called transfer factor. And somehow that transfer factor actually takes antibodies and makes them functional in your body. So it becomes this antiviral food. And I always reference this study because it just blows my mind that um, this is in PubMed. So that's like a you know fantastic sort of uh, medical library of um, peer-reviewed science. And there's a study in there where they took individuals who are high risk for flu. So just like we've been hearing so much about with COVID, you've got these high risk individuals. So they took high risk individuals. Some of them, well, one, one group is a control group. One group is vaccinated for flu. One group is given colostrum. And what they found is that the colostrum group had three times less flu symptom than the vaccine group. In other words, like, you know, because I'm one of these people where it's like, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not going to call myself an anti-vaxxer. Uh, I'm also not pro-vax. I'm like sort of like, hey man, I think minimal amount of injections, please, for me. And I want to know what they do and I want to know what's in them. And I believe that vaccine theory can work, but I don't think it's nearly as effective as, as it's been, we've been told, right? Uh, especially when it comes to flu, where you have these rapidly mutating viruses. Uh, so it's interesting to me that colostrum is three times more effective than the vaccine itself. And the article notes, and it's also very affordable. So you start to look at this, like, why is, why don't people know this? You know, people are getting these vaccines every year or sometimes multiple times a year. And then high risk individuals are getting those, I forget what they call it, the super potent ones where they get the like, the jumbo vaccine that they do, you know, uh, but colostrum is three times more effective against the flu than the vaccine. So it's like, wow, are you kidding me? I'll take that, please, because it's delicious and it goes in my smoothies every morning. Um, so yeah, it's a really powerful immune food fortifier um, because of this transfer factor. Whatever viruses that animal's been exposed to, it can pass that immunity on. Uh, it also has, because it's for infants, it has all of the known mammalian growth factors. It's a complete food. So it has all of the amino acids, all of the lipids, and all of the glyconutrients or sugar nutrients that are required by the body's immune system. So it's just like the most complete food in the world for mammals. Um, and it's delicious. So for me, it's in my smoothies every day, you know, first thing in the morning. I do something with chaga and blueberries and my colostrum and my maple syrup that I make here on the property and everything. And um, that's just sort of part of my immune strategy. But I, just going back, because it does a lot of other things. Like if you're somebody with digestive issues, you really should be looking at colostrum at least as being part of your approach to healing. I mean, I think it's, again, with supplements, like nothing is the, it's not the sole answer, right? It's like, just like with testosterone, it's like pine pollen really helps. It's an ally. But you know, if you're not exercising and you're not eating well and you're not sleeping and you're not getting sun exposure, like it's going to be less effective. You need the whole lifestyle piece. Um, but I mean, I just can't imagine a gut healing program that doesn't include it or at least look at it significantly. I noticed on the bottle, this is just a personal question. <laughs> I guess I could have hit up customer service, but uh, I noticed on the bottle, I think it says cold processed on the colostrum. And then I realized one day I'm like, wait, if they went, if they took the care to process it, which I'm assuming is like the drying of the liquid and yeah, spray drying. Uh, am I ruining it by putting in a hot ass coffee elixir? Man, it's not like your coffee's 450 degrees. I wouldn't worry, I wouldn't worry about that. You know, what, the, anything in liquid water is, is restricted to hundred degrees Celsius. It's just not really that hot. Oh, okay. You know, and then it's like you take it off the boiling water, and immediately the temperature is dropping down. And by the time you're actually blending, like if it's not melting your blender, I wouldn't worry about it. Cool, good, because yeah, I'd be yeah. so like heartbroken because it's <laughs> you, yeah, it's not cheap in the amount that I no, use. No, it's not. Like followed, you know, like a normal person's, uh, you know, the dietary 
you know, serving recommendation. It, it, it's like doable, but my, my use is also multiple times. Like I'm using, I put a scoop in mine. Um, so I'm probably using, I don't know, whatever a, the general supplement scoop is, but yeah, so it's functionally, I use much more than the recommended dose, which is that teaspoon. But you know, when we started selling that product, it came in a six and a half ounce container. And then we were like, oh man, people are really going through this stuff. Let's do a, a liter container and then or a kilo. And now we're up to that Darth Vader helmet size one. I, that makes me laugh because it's got that... When I see those... I mean, I'm going to show it again. It's ridiculous, right? When I see these, I think like GNC, you know, protein whey powder, whatever. I didn't. I wasn't super excited to go to that container because I found it a, a little obnoxious. You know, it's like just a little idiocracy looking to me. But that's the one that I use too uh, because I, you know, I go through them pretty pretty efficiently. Yeah. So, well, the thing is too. Uh, other like I'll be at the health food store and I see colostrum. I'm like, ooh, what's that? And it's like a tiny ass little bottle with capsules yeah. in the rec. You know, it's like take two capsules yeah. a day. And I'm always thinking, what's that going to do? I mean, maybe- a lot of those too though are, are um, if you pull those capsules apart and you look at the material, they've been defatted so that they have this long-term shelf stability. So they're denaturing the product quite a bit, or a lot of them have been made to be instantized so that you can uh, easily blend it into, like dissolve it into water. Because like, you know with this, if you put this, like a spoonful of this on top of some water, it's just going to like float on the top because it's fatty. Yeah. Uh, So you need to blend it. But that's because we're not extracting those fats out. Um, you know, whenever you have lipids present, now you have to be more careful with heat and light exposure and all of that. But you have a more nutritious food, so it'd be like if I gave you um, salmon, but I took all the fat out first. You're not gonna have to worry about the salmon getting rancid. But you know, where's the benefit now? You've taken all the good stuff. You know? Right. All right. Last thing I want to ask you about because I haven't I haven't tried this yet is the um, this taboo aphrodisiac. Dude, it's no joke. <laughs> that stuff's no joke, bro. <laughs> we uh, haven't texted me about. It. He's like, you've tried that, right? And I was like, no, I actually didn't even know. Oh, it. you gotta, you gotta I try it. Put it on the site. Yeah, Ooh, that's a really unique product. So um, there's a, a very, there's a proprietarily large dose of antler velvet in there. Um, we don't really reveal how much because uh, I don't want people comparing it to our other antler products. But it's a lot. Um, there's a uh, two nutraceuticals in there. One is a nutraceutical extract of... So these are like scientifically validated, researched extracts, one from tribulus and one from that plant we call horny goatweed. So those are two nutraceuticals that are in there. And then this heavy dose of, of really rich cacao uh, and in that alcohol base, right? So when you... <laughs> When you shake this thing up, it's like, and you squirt it on your tongue, it's kind of like liquid chocolate bar with some like, there's also more plama in it. So you get these like bitter aphrodisiac herbs in the back. Um, What it does is causes engorgement in your erectile tissue. So that one's like one I'll take before we head into the bedroom. And dude, it's both partners because all genders are benefited by this. You know, everybody with erectile tissue benefits from this. So that's nipples, that's lips, nipples, clits, penises, everything that gets erect, right? So it flushes that stuff with blood um, and creates long sustained, you know, erectile flushing, we'll say. So, uh, but the flavor of it is it's so rich in cacao that... um, it's erotic just to taste it, if you will. I don't know if that makes sense, but when you taste it, you're like, oh, geez, kind of like almost puts you in the mood. Anyway, that product was initially when when we worked with a formulator on it and they really liked it as a woman's um, hormone balancer. And I was like, I don't know, guys, that's not what I'm, <laughs> I'm finding, like maybe, but I find this thing to be very... And the problem is this, when you try to market, like, because we'll have people be like, antler velvet, yeah, buddy, why don't you just sell rhino horns and shark fins? And it's like, hey, dude, you don't know what you're talking about. It's a very different thing. You start to promote the idea of aphrodisiacs. And I think people are really jaded about that kind of thing. But, um, but they're not jaded about Viagra because Viagra causes erectile tissue to flood, right? Women take it too sexually for that reason. So anyway, I would recommend that people who have uh, or maintain a active sexual practice uh, give this stuff a try, man, because wow. It's just, it's significant. It has a significant impact on me. I really, really like it. And it's really delicious. I'm sold. Um, but I, it's exciting. 
I'm on it. I want to get some ship. We'll send you out a bottle, dude. It's a, it's incredible. I think my brother might've sent you out a bottle of it. Oh, cool. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, shout out to Caleb. <laughs> dude, I said it was the last one, but um, you mentioned elk antler. And I think a lot of people have either never heard of that or if they have, they envision what you just... Um, yeah. Straight horns. Yeah, that, you know, you're like ripping the horns off this innocent deer or elk or something like that. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of deer uh, antler on the market. So give us a breakdown of like the difference between those two animals, how it's harvested uh, the right way, the wrong way, and why someone would want to put an extract of an antler in their body. Yeah. Well, well, elk are deer um, as well. So deer is a big family of cervid mammals, right? So uh, like for instance, here in Maine, we have moose. That's the largest of the deer species. Oh, shit. So, yeah. So you could theoretically make this out of moose, elk, any of the deer species. Um, these are animals that produce antlers. So un, not uh, what a rhino has, which is a horn, or a cow has, which is a horn, uh, or like all those African plains animals that we see with all of the really amazing you know, head ornaments, that stuff's horn. Um, but antler is something different because antler grows every year and falls off at the end of the year. So like here in Maine, we have a lot of uh, all over the country, you know, and especially in the hunting world, you have this whole thing of called shed collecting, where what people do is they go out into the woods to find antlers that have been dropped by the animal in the early winter. They actually break right out of the skull and fall off. And that's why like in the spring, I'll see deer out in the fields here and I can't tell if they're males or females because they don't have antlers. So once an animal grows horns, it always has those horns, right? So if you think of like a ram, you know, like a mountain sheep, like every year that thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because it just keeps growing. They don't ever come off. So deer, elk, moose, they drop those every year. So if you think about that, that's what's fascinating is that means they have to regrow them. And when you think about mammals, we don't, we're not really good at regrowing body parts. There are animals that are, right? Like if I take a lobster and I break its arm off, the next year it's going to molt and grow a new arm back. Right? We have species of crabs that we go crabbing for where you just break off their two arms, put the crab back. Crab regrows those arms, you bring the arms home and eat them. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool way of sustainably crabbing for certain species, right? Because wow. they can do that. But with mammals, as anybody who's had an amputation knows, we don't have the technology right now to regrow a lost limb. So w- why I'm fascinated by antlers is, is that they regrow and they regrow bigger than they grew the year before until that animal reaches a sort of peak of maturity. So what happens is in like three months time, it goes from little bumps on the skull to those fully... Now, you know, anybody who's seen elk compared to a deer, like here, we, we don't have elk here where I live. We have white-tailed deer. Um, you know, and their racks will be about this big. But then you see an elk and that thing's four or five feet long with all of these tines coming off of it. It's growing that in a couple of months. And when it's early in growth, it's quite soft to the touch and warm because it's vascularized. Blood is pumping through it. And there's a layer of skin with like fuzzy hair. Everybody's seen that. That's why we call it velvet. So in the beginning, when they have all that, they are filled with all these steroidal compounds because it's in this rapid growth phase. To get that thing to grow, I mean, it's growing up to two inches a day. So in order to do that, it has to, right? Think about that because same. it's not just like a bone either. It hardens to bone, but initially it's got skin, it's got hair, it's got veins, arteries, lymph. It's, it's a, like an arm growing two inches a day. So if you think about what's going on with the stem cells and the steroids in that material... That's something that people have looked at for thousands and thousands of years, especially in Asia and in, in, in Russia. And we're like, well, let's eat that. <laughs> you know, can we eat that? Uh, so yeah, you can. And if you produce it right, you can actually absorb those molecules. I'm, I don't, I'm not at odds with the Chinese method, but I don't understand it because they cook it and cook it and cook it um, into like a broth, which destroys all those growth factors. But the Russian method, which is what we've adapted for our product, is where you actually do it in alcohol, raw, uh, and you're able to extract all that stuff and then absorb it that way. So, uh, you know, my opinion is that I have yet to see something from the natural world in the way that, like, if you wanted to replace testosterone hormone therapy 
naturally, pine pollen is where I ended up. It was like, this thing does that better than anything I've seen outside of the pharmaceutical industry. If you're looking for like what works best steroidally for recovery, so that could be from your workouts, but that could also be from a surgery or something like that. If you're looking for regeneration or anti-aging or any of those kind of things, I haven't seen anything better than this because that's what that is. It's a rapidly growing youthful tissue that you know contains all of the things that get mammal tissue growing. So anyway, that can be extracted in alcohol. Um, we harvest it. Ours is all coming from in the United States and basically big free range ranches where once a year, the males have their antlers clipped when they have their annual, they do like an annual vet checkup basically. And when they do that, they turn kick those off and cut them off, which they originally did just because they were, you know, initially they were venison farms and they would remove those antlers because they were dangerous to the farmers there, the ranchers. But over time, they've shifted. Now they don't do any slaughter at all where, where these come from. They're only raising the animals for the antler because it's become such a valuable commodity. So once a year at the routine checkups, those are basically just clipped off. They, they first uh, anesthetize the nerve that feeds it uh, so there's no pain. And then they clip them off, tourniquet them. And then later that day, that animal's back out. So it's a no-kill method to get them. Uh, and anyway, they have very... I mean, we've seen over the years, like the NFL has banned it. You know, we've seen these big, um, yeah, we've seen like, uh, what's that? It's like considered doping? Yeah, because it has IGF-1 and IGF-2 and all of these growth factors that you're not allowed to take individually. So um, we've seen all kinds of issues. We've seen big scandals over the years where, um, you know, a, a, some athlete is caught using it or whatever, and it becomes a big scandal and all these questions emerge. Our sales of it usually crank during those times. It's quite funny to watch because people are like, oh, they're doing that? I want some. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, if you're looking for something to give you an edge, it could be athletically, it could be um, in the aging area, it could be in you know regeneration, it could be just in skin maintenance because you know there's six types of collagen in it, very absorbable collagen. Um, that product, as you've seen too, when you look at the color of it, it's that bright, brilliant pink, like almost like the inside of your lips or on your eyes or something, where you have that really um, rapidly turning over tissue. That's the color of it. And uh, man, it's very absorbable. So it's just been one of our flagship products. And like I said, over the years, you know, people kind of give us a hard time because they can't imagine something like that can really work. But when you look at the history and look at the science, it's like, it's really impressive. In fact, I think it, it's probably ve- very underutilized, um, particularly in athletics and things like that. Who were the first people uh, on record to turn antler into a medicine? Was it the Chinese? I would think it's the Chinese. Their tradition is many thousands of years old. And from my understanding, the Russian tradition is uh, where they call it horns of gold is like maybe a thousand years old. So less time over there. But that's also hard to say because you know it's not like we have good evidence of that. I would assume this has been done for a long time. But the ability to do the extract that we do requires ethanol. And ethanol didn't exist until fairly recently in history because that comes out of the ability to distill alcohol. Um, and so the Russians figured it out when they were doing their Cold War super soldier, super athlete programs. And that we, we utilized the method that they developed because they did a really scientific approach looking like how do we get the most benefit out of this for our athletes and for our soldiers. And so we've used that research and the way that we put that product together. Cool, cool. Well... Hot damn, dude. I think uh, I think we've covered everything I wanted to ask you. It's so funny because when we, when we started today, I was like, yeah, I, I just, I got a few questions, you know, probably we'll be good an hour, you know, we'll probably just wrap it up. <laughs> shorter ones, but looking back historically, when you and I get to running our mouths, it's long it, one. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot to, to talk about. So uh, man, I appreciate, I appreciate you taking the time and uh, you know, again, back to what I was saying in the beginning, thanks for being here with me on the beginning of my journey and always being so supportive. And I, you know, I'm hope that I'm able to return that uh, to you by getting your message out and sharing with people what you're up to. Uh, before we close it out, who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced your work that people might be able to go learn from? Man, you always ask me that. I always feel so put on the spot. I, maybe someday I need a new question because you've been on so many times now. Yeah, well, I never have a good answer for you. It changes for me all the time. Um, ask me, can I have a different question? <laughs> all right. I'll let you off the hook because you've been on so many times. Yeah. How many influences can you have? Just tell us uh, where we can find you, you know, the Wild Fed Project, uh, Sir Thrival, various social media yeah. and stuff for people that want to go check you out right now. 
Well, yeah, the company we've been talking about, Sir Thrival, S-U-R-T-H-R-I-V-A-L. So it's like thrive in the word survive. So Sir Thrival, uh, the term comes from me being like, hey, the world's going to get really weird. We're going to need products to thrive in a time of kind of survival. And it's like, well, that's starting to happen. So uh, that's surthrival.com. Um, and then Wild Fed is at wild-fed.com. That's my TV show. And I'd love for people to check that out. Um, we actually made a coupon code for your listeners, by the way, Luke15. We'll get we'll get people uh, 15% off the pot, the entire season episode one through eight of the Wild Fed TV show. Um, I'm on Instagram at Daniel Vitalis, where I really do write. So I approach... I, I think of my Instagram like as if I have a column uh, for a newspaper or a magazine. I really put some heart into writing there. Uh, so that's a place. And then um, my podcast is called Wild Fed. So you can find that uh, as well anywhere you get podcasts. Awesome, man. Yeah, I love your TV show, honestly. Thank you. Thank you. At the adventure, but like I said earlier, at the end of it, I'm always just like, ah, I want to taste that food. It's- We're editing season two right now. So uh, we've got eight more episodes in the pipe. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, man. And I think I think the work you're doing with Wildfed is really important too. As as someone, as you know, who was raised, you know, h- half of the time by my dad, who was, uh, you know, his entire life an avid fisherman and hunter. I don't think he did much foraging, but definitely, uh, you know, his main passion in life was hunting and fishing, and just seeing the reverence and respect that he had for the animals and for the land on which those animals live. Um, I think it's something that people outside of the world of hunting and fishing don't understand. Many people, um, I think that have not had that direct experience perceive people that hunt as being some oafs that just like go out on the land and just trash it and kill a bunch of animals and are not reverent and respectful in that practice. And I'm sure there are people that are that way as well. But in my experience of knowing a few uh, folks like you with that passion, um, it's the converse. And I would say uh, you probably have a more intimate relationship with and respect for the environment that many then do many environmentalists, quote, end quote. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so one thing that I've really enjoyed about the Wildfed series is just seeing the care with which you guys interact with the environment. And the uh, you know the leave no trace, and you go hunt for leaks, and you want to make sure that there's enough for the next season for that you know that that particular species to plur- proliferate. What's the word? Prolif- proliferate. Proliferate, and uh, and come back again, and leave some for the next people. And it's just this beautiful uh, you know uh, symphony of interacting with the natural world, and it's just it's really entertaining and it's really inspiring. And it's like every time it's like, ah, oh, I want to do that. And then I'm like, well, yeah, I'm in LA. <laughs> yeah. We're trying to we're trying to make it like um a culinary adventure series so that it's just interesting to watch whether you do it or not. But then we're also trying to always create inroads for people who maybe do want to try it as well. Um, the thing is, is uh, sometimes people will criticize my work and say, well, seven billion people can't do that. And I'm like, when did I say they could? I never said that. Seven billion people can't play golf either. Uh, nobody criticizes play, people who play golf over that. Uh, that's not the the, whole, the point of the thing. Isn't that everybody can do it? Um, but there's a lot more room for a lot more people to do it. And those of us who are doing it, and this is true of a lot of modern day hunters too. I think that that you know that stereotype is partly based in truth, but a lot of it comes from. Elmer Fudd and Bambi and places that were in, you know, hunters were intentionally um, misrepresented. So, um, and then the foraging piece alters the whole game a little bit. It's like, oh, wait, they care about plants too. Oh, they care about mushrooms too. So, we're trying to really bring this unifying theory of wild food together in that show. Um, but we need more people on board because we're stewards, we're, we're ecological, we're citizen ecologists, and we're stewards of the landscape. And so for people who feel any kind of calling there, um, one thing I'll add too is that in addition to the show we've made, a two, each episode has a two-hour director's cut that goes with it if you're inclined to see those too, if you want to go deeper. So the show is just great entertainment. But if you're like, hey, I want to learn, like how did you do that? Where do you look? How, what tools do you use? How does that all work? We've made director's cuts so people can kind of get started too. So that's really important to me. So uh, yeah, and the thing is, is that a lot of it, I, I brought this up last time we were on your show, but a lot of it, you know, just the other day I had a guy on, he's an actor um, by trade, you know, uh, he's an actor in New York. Oh, I heard um, 
Oh yeah. You heard that episode. So yeah, he's, he's got this project where he's taken people in New York city, just outside the city to hunt and to forage. Um, you wouldn't think you think you'd have to be in a rural place, but you'd be amazed at what you can accomplish even when you're in an urban environment. So, um, I'm looking to me, the real project is about uh, creating a bridge for human beings to reverse a little of that domestication and make their way back into, uh, not the wilds like deep out in the Yukon, but more like the wildness that's really all around you. Well, you inspired me. I'll share this with you and then we'll, and we'll call it a day. But uh, I recently just, you know, in the midst of the, you know, lockdown shit and all this stuff, I just, yeah, I've just kind of hunkered down and made the best of it. But I did manage to escape the city for a few days and I went up to Yosemite and, and rented a house up there. And the backyard of this house is called the Forest House, which a fellow um, podcaster, Lacey Phillips, owns and, and uh, leases or rents it out on Airbnb. Beautifully, like really well done, like remodeled home. And the backyard is the forest, you know, it's, it's probably on a half an acre, but it's enough forest to go out and not see neighbors and really mm-hmm. interact. And I went up there and there's a creek running through her, her backyard there. And I went up there and um, did a, a very heroic dose of mushrooms and uh, just spent the whole day crawling around in the forest. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, Dude, oh man, it just it makes my heart just burst open. It was so beautiful, you know. And it wasn't because of the mushrooms. I mean, they just give you that childlike fascination with every single thing you see. You start to notice things. Yeah, I mean, and I'm just like I'm pulling up rocks and playing with salamanders and just looking at spider webs. And I mean, it was just a beautiful. (laughs) And just going like, what am I doing all day? Why? (laughs) How am I not noticing this stuff? Right. And you know, in, in the in the spirit of integration, to be honest, because you you know, in the, in, you can't live like that every day. These experiences aren't meant to be, at least in my opinion, uh, an everyday occurrence. So they you know they lose their specialness and could be ultimately distracting, if not destructive. But I have found myself noticing my natural environment in a different way since that weekend. Even in my own yeah. backyard, I'm like, whoa! And I just sit and stare at the tree or I just watch the way the wind interfaces with the trees and that. But anyway, the point of the story is at one point I made my way down to this creek. Probably it was, you know, maybe 50 feet down the hill. It took me about four hours to get that far. But I finally got down in the creek and I realized the whole creek is a salad. (laughs) Watercress in there. There's all these different types of mint, like that lemony kind of mint and these other kind of mints. And I spent a couple hours down there just gorging on this creek salad. And it was one of the most special experiences in nature I've ever had because there was this visceral past life memory of like, wait, this is who we are. And it was so beautiful. Um, If you know the names of every Kardashian and you don't know any of the plants on your lawn, it's time to get like reoriented to nature. Hey, so I'm sitting there and I'm eating this watercress and I thought of you because I'm like, this shit is spicy. This is not like the water. I mean, it's like, I don't know, eating like, it's like eating, uh, you know, like concentrated radish or something, just really peppery and delicious. And I'm just eating that and I'm balancing out with my different mints. And uh, I'm sitting there and I thought, man, you know, Luke, you got to get out into nature more. And that thought kind of came to me. And then immediately, as does when you're having assistance from, those other realms, immediately this realization came to me that was like, you don't need to get in nature. You are nature. Mm. And it was just like, oh shit. Yeah. And I also need to get into what I or which is getting nature. So um, speaking of nature, our uh, leaf blower has just... (laughs) (laughs) My neighbor's like, I'm sick of this guy's ass. We got (laughs) to... He's been going for three hours, but man, thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you for being a great friend and, uh, you know, just uh, bless all of your ventures and, you know, let me know what I can do to support. I'm really excited to share uh, your body of work and wisdom with the audience for those that didn't know you and remind those that did. So with that, I will uh, bid you farewell, my friend. Thanks, Luke. Stay sane, man.